right around the time I was getting out is when the Air Force was realizing because of September 11th, our numbers are so padded. Like we have so many people that are in now. We've got to start getting rid of people. So first they, um, they offered, Hey, if you want to get out, like if you just, if you're just tired of being in the military and you want to get out early and you don't want to retire and you don't want to wait till your, your contract's up, like go, you know, come talk to us. We'll let you go. So they did that and it wasn't enough people. And then they started kicking people out. Like you're kind of a shitbird. You're out of here. You know, you, you've got a bunch of DUIs. You're out of here. They started doing that and it still wasn't enough. So they were like four shrinking their numbers down. So they started limiting um, the amount of promotions. So if you, they used to say like, okay, if you're in this career field and you're going to test for staff sergeant, um, you know, we're going to promote 300 people. Then it would shrunk to like 75, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay, well you didn't promote. So, you know, you're kind of like, there's a watchful eye on you. Why didn't you promote? You know what I mean? If you miss enough promotions, eventually they boot you. So, Around this time, a lot of people are leaving and they're going to work as contractors for like the Singapore squadron and there was another squadron like that on our base. So that my option, I missed that boat. You know what I mean? There, there's these guys that are 10 years into my career field with much more experience right. that are going and taking those jobs versus my four. So yeah, I, I wish that was an option, but it wasn't. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. You feeling the stress yet of having to put out podcasts? So we record usually two at a time and we record on Sundays and our release date's Tuesday. So that first week is like crunch time. Like, okay, I've got two days and I have to work still <laughs> to edit the pod audio, like take all the coughs and the, the, you know, throat clearing out and whatnot. Then I overlay that. When it was just audio, it was easy. I could do that in bed in you know, 30 minutes. <laughs> but then now that I'm doing the video, it's like, I've got to overlay that over the video, match everything up, which isn't difficult. But now I've got to sit there and chop the video up for two people. And then once that's done, that's, I got to send it off to him for review. He, he's, he runs this, um, the meme account, um, O's nation. It's got like 55,000 followers or something like that. So he knows viral moments. So I'm like, I'm gonna leave it up to you. We'll, we'll record. I'll do all the, the production work. You tell me what to make clips of. So then he'll listen to everything and he'll be like, uh, from, you know, this timestamp to this timestamp, that's one clip. And he'll send me like five or six. And then I go back and I'll chop those clips up. They take 15 minutes a piece. It's not hard, but it's just that initial, like I have from Sunday, cause we record Sunday nights, usually Sunday night and I've got Monday and I've got to have it done like essentially Monday night. Uh, so that that first one, then, then, then the second week, it's like, I've got the whole week to edit it and, and right. it, yeah, I could do it whenever I have spare time. And I think that's one of the things in talking to people who are thinking about a podcast, I tell them, I go, Understand that once you make the commitment to an audience right. that you're going to produce a product for them, right. they may not be very forgiving if, oh, oh I missed this week. Right. You know, if you set a schedule, you have to adhere to it. Right. And for me, I release on Monday morning. So there are some, there are some Sunday nights where I've been up at, you know, midnight, right. one o'clock in the morning, pushing everything out, pushing the video out. So it's just that, that thing of once you make that commitment though, right. it's like, I'm going to stick to it. I think it, in my benefit, having a partner makes it a little easier. He kind of handles the social media engagement stuff for the most part. He'll post everything to his OS nation account and then tags the, um, BGG balance account, which I run, which isn't difficult because he just makes me a, um, a collaborator on everything. Right. So we get his audience and then it, it just rolls into mine as well. So I'm like, sweet, you do that. He schedules all the posts. He makes all the comments. He does all the hashtags all that stuff. All I'm doing is just recording, doing the editing and, you know, being a, a figurehead. So I'm, I'm it, it's definitely beneficial having some help. You know what I mean? I don't know how you do it solo. <laughs> I know you've got an editor and stuff, yeah. but it's just, man, it's a lot. So before we go deeper into that podcast and we'll definitely get into that down the road, let's go backwards a little bit. Okay. Let's talk about the young Kenny. <sighs> okay. Um, Where's hometown? I was born in Sacramento. Okay. Uh, California. 
And when I was four and a half, we moved to San Diego. So um, my mom and dad uh, separated relatively early. Well, I was like two or something like that. Um, it was my mom's second marriage. Uh, I'm the youngest of two on my mom's side. And my um, my sister's father was really abusive. And my mom had um, gotten with him when she was like 16. So from like 16 to like 20 three or 24 or whatever. It was just like a really bad abusive relationship. Finally, she left him and she told herself like, I'm never going to do that again. She um, met my dad. Um, They had a wild weekend. Um, My dad was like a nightclub DJ. So she, they met at his work and um, she got pregnant and um, I'm going to go deep fast. (laughs) So something like if if this is ever an instance in your parent, don't tell your child this scarred me for life. Um, but I look back at it now and, in, in, um, in hindsight and I'm like, I'm appreciative. My mom told me my, my parents are very religious. So obviously when it comes to like, um, uh, the, the whole pro choice argument, like that's right. been a, a topic in my household since I was a little kid. And I remember my mom telling me like, well, you know, I, I had an import, an appointment to have an abortion with you. Like when you were, you know, before you were born. And I'm like, I think I'm like 13 or 14 when she's telling me this. I'm like, why are you telling me? (laughs) And she's like, but I, she goes, I was driving down to the clinic and she goes, something told me to pull over. And I, she goes, I just started crying and I turned around and I went home. I'm like, okay, well, I'm thankful that happened. But it, um, it was one of those things where like she told my dad and he was just like, he was, you know, it was a nightclub DJ. He was very, he had a lot of women. Right. And uh, she's like, I, I don't want to do this alone. Da, 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 da. And he's just like, you know, please, please don't get rid of it. Like, I, you know, I want this child so bad. Like, that's my son. Da, 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 da. And they got married. How old are your mom and dad at this time? <sighs> 20. She was 26. And I think he was 28 or 29. So not young, young, but still younger. Yeah. And uh, so they got married uh, on a whim. And um, she, uh, I want to say like maybe six months into it or something like that. Um, uh, there was some cheating and stuff like that. And then shortly after that, there was some like physical, she called him out on, there was some physical abuse and she was like, I'm done. I'm not doing this. So she was out. Cause she'd already experienced that with her previous husband. Correct. Correct. So, um, then my mom, so, you know, me being little, uh, I, I don't remember a ton of my like early time. There's like little core memories like that I have from that early childhood. Um, but it, my, my, consistent memories or like growing up doesn't really start until we moved to San Diego. Like I don't, I don't remember even, even though later in life I, I moved to Northern California and I like, I lived in all the areas that technically I lived in when I was little. I don't remember any of that, any of the area. Like I, I wasn't, there was no concept of like geographic location or anything when you're two or three. What brought your mom down to San Diego? So she was dating a guy um, that was a, a public defender and, um, he had a friend that was uh, a lawyer. So I guess you can, you, as long as you have a law degree, even though you haven't passed the bar, you can still be a public defender. So he hadn't passed the bar yet. And he, he had a friend that he went to law school with that had a practice in San Diego. So the plan was we were going to move down to San Diego. This guy was going to help him study for the bar. He was going to pass the bar and then join the firm. Well, that never happened. We moved down to San Diego um, and uh, it started in like uh, Imperial Beach, Chula Vista, Otay area. And, uh, that was pretty much where I grew up most of my life until like maybe like, um, early teenage years. We kind of lived in like Paradise Hills national city, but always South San Diego. Um, she was with that guy until I was like 12 and, uh, they, this is like, essentially this is the guy that had raised me. Like my dad wasn't really around again. My dad lived in Northern California. He was just kind of that guy, but you seeing him much growing up. Summers, uh, I'd fly out for like a month or two and then Christmas uh, breaks and whatnot. But my dad would, um, given his job, he would uh, he'd pick me up at the airport. Usually, sometimes it'd be my grandma. But he worked nights and he lived the party lifestyle. So I would show up and he would dump me at my grandma's or my aunt's and he would kind of go about his business. And then he would show back up and maybe we'd go on a camping trip or something like that. And then it would, it would dump me back at grandma's and come back, you know, four or five days later. And it's like, I had a cousin that my, my grandma and my aunt live next door to each other. And my cousin is a few months older than me. Um, and to this day, we're like, we speak on the phone every single day on my way home from work. Like more like a brother to you than yeah, a cousin. Yeah. Um, 
So we were really close. I was fortunate that if it wasn't for him, I would have been bored out of my mind, my, my entire childhood break, um, you know, Christmas break, summer vacation, et cetera. So, but, uh, having an older sister with a different dad too, it was kind of a bummer. Like those are, I, I think summers are like the times where you bond with your siblings cause you're both out of school and stuff like that. And she's older than me. She's like seven and a half years older than me. But like, even then either I would be a gone for Chris or for summer vacation or she would be gone for summer vacation. And, um, the seven year age gap too is already a natural barrier. Yeah. 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 It, it was, it was weird. Cause there, there'd be times where like my sister would say things like, you know, if, if neighborhood kid was picking on me or something like that, she, she, she'd play the big sister role, but it was like, where, you know, where are you all the other times? You know I mean? It was, <laughs> it was kind of a weird thing, but, um, yeah. So, um, so that we, we got down to San Diego and I was like just before kindergarten, I remember coming down here, I think kindergarten had already started. And, uh, I, I got put into a school in Chula Vista and a couple months later, like we moved, we moved, we, we were in this, I don't know. I, I've never went back and asked my mom, like, why, why were we only in that apartment for like six months? But like, I, I, I don't remember any of the kids from that class. I vaguely remember what school it was, but we moved to a, a new apartment in Otai and then I started kindergarten there, but the year's already a few months in. So those kids have already established friendships. And now I'm just kind of like this weird outsider kid. And I bounced around. I went to four different five, four different elementary schools. We just bounced around a lot and into like different areas. So I was like relocating schools all the time. Do you always kind of feel like you were the fish out of water, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. For the bouncing around thing too. And just, just geographically, I mean, there's not, um, in, in like Ocho Chula Vista, there's not a lot of people that look like me. So it's, it was, you know, in the, in the younger years, it's like these kids all speak Spanish. They're all talking to each other. Like they all have these established friendships in the neighborhoods they, they live in. And I don't have any tie to any of that. You know, it's, um, it was, and then my older sister, uh, she's also, she's half Mexican. So it's like, she looks like them. I don't. Right. So there was like, she kind of fit in a little easier. Um, she was also like an athlete and stuff like that. So she you know, popped right into sports and stuff and developed friendships with that. Whereas I was young, I was five, six, I didn't have anything like that. And we've talked about this previously. So you've got an artistic side to you as a kid growing up though. What was taking up your time? Um, a, a lot of playing outside. Um, were you into sports? I mean, not organized. really, not really. I played, um, soccer, like kindergarten, first and second grade. And I, didn't I didn't enjoy it. I didn't know it. It was like I don't know, just maybe bad coaching or just a, it was like the sport to do, <clears throat> and um, I didn't get it. I played baseball a little bit in um, like fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, but um, not having like a father figure around really. Like there was nobody there to teach me that. So it's like I kind of came in late. And my mom, when she left that guy, I think I was maybe ten, ten or eleven. And that was kind of devastating. He was, <clears throat> he was athletic, but he was a bodybuilder. So he was obsessed with just like constantly working out. And I had that early influence. Like I want to be strong and I want to be muscular someday. That never happened. But um, <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. And my mom was, she, she was a competitive bodybuilder as well when I was younger. So then she hurt her back and she was like couch bound for like a year. Um, trying to avoid surgery and whatnot. So it was a lot of a uh, like typical nineties kid, um, late eighties, early nineties kid, kind of like latchkey kid. Like, um, before the, my mom and that guy had separated, he worked for the trolley system, but he worked night shift. Um, so he was like a mechanic on trolleys. Um, the, the p passing of the barn never happened at least, you know, while we were around my mom, um, was, uh, uh owned a business cleaning houses. So she's a housekeeper and she worked from, seven or eight in the morning till eight, nine o'clock at night. You know, there'd be times where it would just be me and my sister at home. My sister would make dinner and my mom would show up and I was already in bed. There would be times where my mom would come pick me and my sister up at like four or five, take us back to work with her. Cause she was doing some commercial stuff and we would be at, you know, whatever business cleaning till, you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night and then come home, eat a really late dinner, go to bed, wake up early, go to school the next day. So, um, and then even into like my teen years and whatnot, um, there was a, a lot of just not really, um, uh, there wasn't a lot of like parental interaction until like maybe like 14, 15 or something like that. 
making a, an assumption, you've got the perfect recipe for a kid that could kind of go off the rails and start getting into trouble. Were you somebody who kind of kept on the straight and narrow? I was definitely afraid because both of my parents were like drug addict alcoholics or like recovered or whatever. And I was like, there's no way I'll get away with anything. Like my, my, uh, I remember being young and my mom telling me stories about how, uh, you know, she had done acid in high, like she was at high school on acid and the, the teacher would pull the kids that were obviously on drugs out of the class. And you're going to go to this other classroom until you're off of the drugs type thing. And she, you know, just like, I was like, I'll never get away with anything. My mom's done every drug imaginable. My dad's done every drug imaginable and they'll kill me if they ever find out. <clears throat> and there's, there will be no hiding it. So no, I didn't do anything wild like that until maybe like my, not drug wise or anything like that, but like maybe like my, my teen years, like 14, 15, I got into like graffiti and I would sneak out. I never got caught. Um, but I did that till I'm like 18. And you mentioned that you <clears throat> went back up North. So where'd you end up graduating from high school? Um, so I went to, I got, um, pulled from a, uh, well, my parents pulled me from, I went to a school in, in San Diego, San Diego school for creative and performing arts. <clears throat> and somebody had stolen a CD player out of my, uh, locker during uh, gym class. And I knew who did it. And I brought it to my parents' attention. They brought it to the principal's attention who then brought it to the student's attention. And he denied it, denied, denied it. He was like gang affiliated or something like that. And then there was like threats that he was going to beat the shit out of me. And. Um, my parents were like, we can't let that happen. So they pulled me out. That was like, I think ninth grade. They pulled me out of that. And then I went to a private uh, Christian school for like 10th, 11th and 10th and 11th grade, a very short amount of 12th grade. Then I left that school because I was like, I'd taken languages so early. I took them junior high. So I didn't have those in high school. So I was like two classes ahead of most of my classmates in the private school. <clears throat> so my senior year, all I had was like, I think an English class, a math class, and that was it. Like, so I had, I'm like, you guys are paying, I don't know how much money every month for me to, to go to two classes. And then they wouldn't let me out on work release. They made me sit in like an empty room and do like classwork. The school wouldn't the let school, you out. Yes. So I was like, this is a waste of money. So I left and I went to a charter school. Um, and I finished those two classes in like a couple of months. I graduated early. I didn't walk with any class. Like I didn't. It, what year was that? 2001 taking a little step backwards. So you initially went to a school for the performing arts. Yeah. What was the, whose drive was that? Was that your drive to want to go or did your parents want you to go to that? So the, um, every district in San Diego has a performing arts school, whether it be an individual school or like they, a school within a school. Um, and so the San Diego unified school district, that was their school. It happened to be one of two local high schools. It was that. And then it was Morse high school, which is, uh, in the hood. And my mom's like, well, I don't want you to go there. And then I started playing trumpet in sixth grade. So she was like, well, you know, you play, you play an instrument, you'll just transfer over here. It's like, okay. So it, it just, it was, they were both equal distance. So it was more in air quotes, the better school for you to go yeah. to. Yeah. And it was like, um, the neat thing about that school, other than, the fact that it was uh, all arts based, there's no sports programs, all the money that would be allotted to sports was allotted to the arts. Um, it was because it was the art school for San Diego. Kids got bust in from like uh, Northern San Diego from, you know, e as far as East County, as far as that district reached out to that, that area and whatnot. So kids came from all over. So I had friends that lived all over San Diego, which was nice, you know, and then I got into skating and I would go skate with friends that lived in other parts of town and spend the night over there. And like, like I, I travel around a lot of San Diego as like a early teen because of just the friendship I, I developed in that and whatnot. As a young man growing up, coming towards the end of high school, did you have any plans for what adult life was going to be? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll step back just a, a hair. When my mom was 12 or when my mom, when I was 12, my mom met a guy at her church and, um, this guy had a thing for my mom. They met in like a, like a singles fellowship type thing. And they went on a date. He asked her on a date. She said, yes, on the, the date he proposed to her, like it's their first date. She says, yes. Two weeks later, my mom marries this guy and he moves in to our house. So my sister at the time is like, I think she's 19. She's super upset. She just bails. She's just like, I, you know, I, I don't know this guy that I don't feel comfortable and she's out. Um, 
So now me being 12, I have this guy who moves in and he's like, I'm the head of the household. You're going to do what I say. Um, I went from being really close with my mom. Like, like we did everything together because she was trying to make up for any lost time that, you know, she had when she was constantly working. So if it was like, we had a show that we'd watch, like we're on the couch together watching the show. Once he moved in, that kind of stopped and looking back in hindsight, I understand it now. He was, he was afraid like your kid's going to end up being too attached to his mom. It's mm-hmm. going to be weird. Like, cause you you're know. going straight into your teenage years yes. where you need to start developing as a young man. Exactly. So, um, I'm thankful for, I'm super close to my stepdad to this day. Um, but in the beginning it was, it was a really, there was, I didn't understand like why, like what, like how come my mom doesn't want to like hang out anymore? Like, why is, is this guy always involved in everything? Why don't we do anything on our own anymore? And like, it was, uh, it was a lot to, to, and, and really quickly, um, you know, kind of changed my life. So, um, now back to the, um, the military thing. So when I was 18, um, I was in a journalism class that I really enjoyed. I really like writing. Like that's my art of choice. I love to write. Um, and I got really into, um, I was really into skating and like making skate videos. So holding a camera wasn't something that, um, felt awkward or anything. So I'm like, I want to be, I, I originally went to college for journalism and film and I wanted to be like a photojournalist. Um, down south in San Diego, or were you up north at this point? No, uh, down south. So at that point, um, I'm like halfway through my freshman year of college, and 9-11 happens. Um, I remember sitting in a creative writing class, beginning of the day, and teacher turns the TV on, you see the second plane going to the towers. And I'm like, I left class, I drove home. I'm like, my mom's at home. My stepdad's at work. He leaves work. He comes home and we're like watching this all go down together. And we're like, what the hell is going on? My stepdad's retired army 20 years. And, um, at that point there was no conversation of military. It was just, I, if, if anything, my parents were probably thinking like, we're going to war, like stay out of the military. We don't want to lose our kid. So, um, taking a quick step backwards coming up while you were in high school and your relationship with your stepdad, was he ever pushing no. the military or almost kind of the opposite, like not <clears throat> pushing towards the military, the opposite. He wanted me to go to college. So stepdad was a high school wrestler, did really well, got a full ride scholarship, uh, to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, turned it down, joined the army. Um, this was during the Vietnam era. So his fear was that I'm going to get drafted anyway. And his recruiter lied to him and said, well, if you sign up for the army today, we won't send you to Vietnam. <clears throat> so he goes to basic training and then he gets orders to Vietnam. And I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. Then he goes back on leave before he goes to Vietnam. And all of a sudden his recruiters on leave. So he's like, I was going to kick that guy's ass. <laughs> so I think his military experience was so messed up in the beginning that he was just like, avoid that, you know? Um, but he did ultimately stay in for a career. He did. He did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I don't think he has any ill will towards the military at this point. I just think, um, if the it's initial some, sales pitch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so which no other veteran has experienced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did. I, we'll get into that in a second of my recruiter experience. So, um, I, so all the nine eleven happens, and at the time I'm dating this girl. Briefly, we're like two months into seeing each other. I'm eighteen, she's nineteen. Um, we find out in October, like the week before Halloween, that she's pregnant. And I tell my mom, I'm like freaking out. Like this girl lives in Poway, I live down in Chula Vista. I'm like. What am I going to do? My mom tells my stepdad, he comes home and just like, you know, you got, you guys aren't living here like that. Like you, it's time to be a man now. Um, you figure it out. But he goes, military might be an option you want to look into. Other than going to college at this time, are you doing any type of work? Yeah, I worked at, um, at, uh, at that time, I think I worked at Ritz camera, uh, in fashion Valley. So it was like a neat job that I enjoy, but I, I mean, it wasn't paying any bills. It was, I paid my cell phone bill. I think that was about <laughs> all I could afford with that. <clears throat> um, so I'm like, okay, military. And I'm talking to my stepdad about it. I'm like, you're the only guy I know that's in the military, you know? Like, so 
growing up in San Diego, having a lot of friends whose parents were in the Navy, I was like, if I'm going to have a child, I'd like to see my kid. So I'm not going to join the Navy because my friend's parents were always gone, you know, uh, six months at a time or longer. And um, I'm like, I don't want to be that, you know. So then my dad was like, or my stepdad was like, well, you know, I was in the Army for 20 years. It's kind of the same deal. Um, you know, you're you're going on deployments if there's, a you know, a war, or, you know, going on or whatnot. So, again, if you want to see your family, maybe don't join the Army. Um, and I, Marine Corps was, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't have it in me at, you know, at that time in my life, I, I look back now and I'm like, I wish I would have, I have a lot of friends that are Marines. Um, and I'm very close with them. And I'm like the, this vibe that I get from you guys, I wish I had that not no slide on, on the air force, which I ended up joining, but you know, that's, that's the route that I went. Um, so I joined the air force. I went down to the recruiter on Halloween, um, 2001. I walk in specifically to the air force recruiter. You had decided the air yeah. force was the route right, you were going walk in. Um, and, uh, I was like, Hey, I want to sign up. And the guy's like, no, he didn't need a sales pitch. I was just like, I'm here to sign up. Like I, you know, it was 2001. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, and I'm alone. So there's no and parents aren't with me or anything like that. He's like, okay. He's like, um, you know what you want to do? I'm like, Nope. You tell me <laughs> like, <laughs> what are my options? So he's going through this book of like options and he's like, well, these are things that you could do, but you're going to choose your job when you go to maps. I'm like, okay. And he's like, but you're going to have to take an ASVAB. I'm like I'm smart. That's fine. You know, whatever. So he sends, uh, sets me up with a maps appointment. Um, I go down there, I think <clears throat> beginning, maybe second week of November or something like that. I go down to maps, um, take the test. So they, they give me my score. They sit down, they give me th this list of options. Now it's September 11th. So basically every job that's worth having has been taken, has been taken. So it's like the, the needs of the air force, you know? So he's like, well, you've got all these jobs here and I didn't want any of them. And he's like, or you, cause I wanted to do like something with computers. I was like, Oh I'll be like a network specialist or something like that. And yeah, no. So <laughs> he's like, well, you can go open electronics. And then when you go open electronics, when you get to basic training, if more jobs open up in that rough field, then you can choose from there in basic. And I'm like, okay. So I did that. Um, I get my, uh, my date to ship out, which is January 5th. Yeah. January 5th, 2002. Um, I ended up getting married, uh, a week before, um, Thanksgiving and uh moved in with my then wife and her parents for november december and then january I shipped out so I go to basic training and uh i think i'm like two weeks in and they're like oh let's go pick your job so then they give me this list of jobs and it's even smaller now and there's like four on there and air uh, <clears throat> 2a6x6 aircraft uh, electrical environmental specialist so just aircraft electrician and I fix AC systems on planes too. I'm like, okay, so that's the job I got. Um, and uh, I had no idea what it was. <laughs> um, finished basic training. They send me off to uh, a technical school in um, uh, North Texas, and I'm there for like, like nine months or something like that. The first two months is just waiting for the school to open up because there's so many people. Because after September 11th, that there's there's no availability. So I waited like almost two months just for a class. And then I was able to take the class, which was like seven months long. And at this time I have a pregnant wife in California. Um, and I, it, it was just a, you know, half, half a country away. And it was like a stressful thing. Um, I barely knew this girl, you know, we dated for a handful of months up to the point where like we got married, we had never been into any sort of like a fight or argument or anything like that. As soon as we got married, like all hell broke loose. And I just saw a completely different side of this person. And, um, this is what, so what was her feelings of you joining the air force? She was good, good with it. Like he stepped up, he's going to support the, the, the baby and the family. He, you know, we can make decent money. Um, yeah. So now not really having much of a father figure, growing up until I was like 12, 13 and then not really having the greatest relationship with my stepdad until my later adult years and not, uh, growing up in a neighborhood where there's a lot of people that look like me. There was a lot of like, I, I had a lot of like kind of outcast syndrome. I was always 
searching for myself, trying to figure out who I was, like what I was really into. Um, there wasn't a lot of, um, attention from girls or anything like that in my early teen years again, cause they didn't like white guys. So, and I'm like, okay, they didn't like trumpet players. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there wasn't, I didn't play sports. So I didn't have like that bond or camaraderie that comes along with like those kind of team sport things. I had friends, I had, you know, good friends. And like, I wasn't like, I wasn't the popular kid, but I wasn't the nerdy kid. I kind of floated in between friend groups. I had like a couple of core friend groups that were into different things. And I kind of bounced in between them. And I was like appreciated and liked amongst those groups, but I was never like the guy, you know? But in your head, did you kind of always feel like you didn't have your place? Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 when I went to college, like I, I met people in my classes, specifically my film class that I, I kind of connected with really quickly. And I was like, Oh, there's other people that are kind of like me that are, you know, but it was so short that nothing really developed out of that. Um, so, and it was just kind of like, I, I hate to say, I hate to use the term like ripped away from me cause I, I got pregnant, but I, I did that, you know? So, but, um, it just, it was really short lived and I didn't really get to experience like what it, it's like to like bond with people that are like you. So, um, now I, I go off to the military and I'm married to this woman that I hardly know. And, uh, up to this point, like there's a lot of fighting. There was like, there was a point in time where I didn't speak to her for like almost three months. Um, she had called me, uh, on the phone or no, I call, I, I called her every single day, every, cause I, I took night classes. So every single day I'd sit on the phone with this woman for like four to five hours in dead silence. She, the TV would be on in the background for her. I'd hear her like watching TV and I'm just sitting there and it's like essentially like I'm being babysat, you know, like if I'm on the phone with her, I can't be doing anything else. Right. Not that there's much to do when you're in technical school. Like you're pretty, pretty locked down at that point. And, um, she, uh, I, I call one day and she makes this accusation. It's wild accusation. And she's just like, I, I think I have an STD. This is your fault that I'm like, well, my fault. Like, I haven't seen you in months. Like how this, how was this my fault? So we get in this big blowout argument and I'm just like, I'm not going to take accusations for doing something that I absolutely positively did not do in any way, shape or form. It's, it would be impossible, you know? So no, not going to, not going to happen. And I hung up the phone, like upset. I went back to my dorm. I cried. I'm like, dude, what is going on? Like, who am I married to? Like what, what's my life going to turn into? Like when we get back together, like when tech school's done and, and we actually are in the same place again. And I didn't talk to her for like two and a half months. And I've talked to my mom on the phone. She's like, Hey, you know, she, she's calling. And I, you know, I think she feels really bad. And I don't think my mom knew the extent of what had happened, but I just kind of like downplayed her. Like, okay, well, I don't feel like talking to her. I'm not. And, um, eventually she made up, she, I guess she went into the doctor and they're like, it was like an ingrown hair or something like that. And she felt bad. And, um, it, I think this was like shortly after the accusation and she had been trying to reach out for months to like apologize. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want your apology, <clears throat> but we ended up making up and, um, I, um, she had the baby like a month before I graduated. So they let me fly out on like an emergency leave from tech school for the weekend to go see the birth of my kid. Um, I missed it by a couple of hours just due to some plane flight delays from DFW to San Diego see my kid for a couple of days and I fly back, I think Sunday night. So I flew out like a Friday evening and then I got there like, like two, two o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. And then I flew out Sunday night and I was back to school Monday. Um, and Take it, taking the stress of a new relationship and being a new father out of the equation, what was that transition like for you into military life? I know People often joke about the, the Air Force being a maybe a step down in the stress factor, all that kind of stuff. But still, it's military life. Yes. Yeah. You know, how'd you how are you adjusting to that? I think that was the first time in my life where I'd ever had any sort of like a um like an acceptance from other males. Um like like genuine, like the, the trauma bonding factor of basic training. And um, I don't think I would have learned to appreciate that until I had left the military. Um, I don't, th I don't think it was hard. There's the initial shock of basic training and like, you know, the breaking down process. 
It's never fun for anybody. The tech school was cool. I made some really good friends, some lifelong friendships that I still have to this day. I met a kid in basic training in, uh, in chapel. That was just an excuse to get away from the barracks for a couple of hours on a Sunday. And we ended up having the same job. Like he, he also went open electronics and he was in my sister flight in basic training. So like I saw him all the time. We never got to speak or anything cause we were in the same area, but we went to the same tech school at the same time, graduated at the same time and everything. Um, we ended up getting, we were, um, the dorms in, in tech school were two people to a room and then that room's connected to another room. So those four people share a bathroom. So he was my sweet mate. He was next door. And we became super close. We were into the same kind of like weird music and stuff. And um, um, my dad, I mentioned my dad was a DJ. I got into DJing. I, you know, dabbled my toe in it. And, you know, when I was 17, 18 years old, and this kid was also into that. He was a little older than me. So we were into the same kind of music there. And that was kind of like my, um, when I was in basic training, when I'm not basic training in, in tech school, as you start to, to go through the schooling, like they start to open up like um, more liberties on base. You don't have to wear a uniform all the time. You can wear, you know, you have to stay on base still. You can't go off base, but you can go do this. You can do that. And uh, somebody, we met like probably three other DJs that um, in, in that same area of base. And we just, every weekend we hung out and we just played music and kind of like isolated ourselves. And um, I was, 19 I couldn't drink or anything like that. So like there was, and at that point I still to the, at that point I'd never done any drugs. I'd never drank nothing like that. So it wasn't even a thought in my head. Like I, I, I'm hanging out with people playing music that I really enjoy and I'm having a good time. Like that's all I cared about. But that was like my little bit of sanity during all the um, issues with my, my wife at the time. And um, that guy when, when we graduated tech school, he got orders to Alaska. I got orders to Phoenix to Luke air force base. And he's like, I don't want to go to Alaska. And there was some other kid in like one class, like the day shift class, they got orders to Arizona and didn't want to go there. So they swapped orders and, um, he got to come to Arizona with me and the other kid went to Alaska. So now my friend from basic training and tech school is now coming to the same base as me. And, um, thank God, because when my eventual divorce happened, if it wasn't for that guy, um, who knows where I would be. So, um, yeah, we, um, I graduate, I go back home, pack everything we own into a U-Haul, leave and drive to Arizona, uh, show up on base. You know, I don't, I have a lot of PCS experience at this point. So I'm like trying to figure everything out. I have a new baby. It's like a handful of months old and um, trying to find housing, an apartment, anything like that. So we get an apartment. We're in there for a couple of months. Um, I'm still the new guy, uh, you know, in the squadron. Um, I'm assigned to the specialist flight, which is electricians, avionics and engine troops all in one shop. Um, and I get thrown into uh, the 61st fighter squadron, which is at that time, the oldest um, F-16s in the Air Force inventory. These jets are older than I am. So I'm just working on <laughs> broken down piece of crap F-16s that are broken every day. And there's tail numbers that are burned into my brain that will never <laughs> leave. <laughs> because every time that jet launches, you know it's breaking and you know that you're fixing it. And you're going to be there until 3 or 4 in the morning. So um, when I, um, I'd say about a year into that uh, uh, duty station, I started to kind of bond with some of the, the older NCOs and stuff that were, you know, they're 26, 27 years old. They're not that much older than me. Quick, goofy question. Sure. So these really old F-16s that you know are breaking every time they go up, uh -huh. what's, the, what's the attitude and the mindset of the pilots assigned to this unit? Okay, so Luke Air Force Base is a fighter pilot, pilot training base. So there's the pilots that are stationed at the 61st and they're the instructors. So they know that they're broken and they're not like, there's so many checks and balances in, in aviation, specifically military aviation that 
the the likelihood of a plane going down is is pretty rare. Um, and if it does, there's like such a massive investigation that they figure out exactly why it happened. Like, there's no question when the, when the investigation's done, you know exactly what happened. So I don't think the pilots were too worried about it. Um, I wasn't thinking necessarily from a, oh man, these things are going to fall out of the sky. It was just kind of like, man, I'm getting stuck in the, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. 1991 it will, Toyota Camry. So the only, the only difference other than everything just being old, um, it, it would be like the avionics packages on them. Those are the things that are important as far as like they get loaded with all the top secret codes that allow you to, to determine whether that jet is on your team or not on your team, that kind of a thing. So the, those things get upgraded constantly. So we were on block C, D aircraft, A, B aircraft. So those are the first two models. It, a and B's A is a single seater. B is a, a two seater. Um, C and D are, are same single and two. The there's block J at that point. Like that's how down the lettering scale <laughs> it had gotten. And so there was two bases. There's a Singapore squadron. That was a, a fighter pilot training base for the Singapore Air Force that was on our base and they had Block J aircraft. So you see the new version, you know, four, <laughs> four squadrons down. You're like, man, I'd really like to work on those. But you just end up with, you know, the older ones. So it's, it's just like the hydraulics are older. The, the wiring is, you know, at that point, like 25 years old or something like that. And it's like. So you're, it's, it's just a lot of that, like, you know, these jets fly, there's, there's stuff that chafes on it. You know, there's, there's constant, there's engineers assigned to every base that are like, um, uh, GSA employees and they are linked directly to, uh, general dynamics. Who's the manufacturer of the F-16 and they're constantly talking about like, Hey, we keep running into this chafing problem in this section of the jet. And then, um, the engineers uh, on base would talk to the guys at general dynamics and figure out like, Oh, here's the best solution for that. Do we need to redo the entire harness? Do we need to put some sort of like a chafing material over it, you know, to prevent that from happening? Do we need to move a component or something like that? So there's, they're constantly modifying these things to keep them in the air. Um, but it just, it just meant more work for us. Um, and I cut you off because you you had mentioned that you started bonding with some of the senior NCOs. Yeah. Okay. So we had a a, a couple of guys that um a, a few I, I still keep in contact with to this day, and they were they were nice enough to like listen to me vent, but they never like interjected their opinions. You know, like nobody ever told me to leave my wife. Um, nobody ever told me like, hey, you got to get out of there. Or, hey, like that's not a good situation. Um. So I, I don't feel like there was may, maybe in hindsight, I wish somebody would have said something, but I probably wouldn't have listened. So maybe that's why they didn't, but they were, they were there to listen at least. And then when I did eventually come to the, to the decision to leave my wife at that time, um, they were very supportive and they're like, dude, if you need a place to stay, you know, cause at that, at that time I owned a house, but I only had one car. My wife at the time didn't work We had two kids. So like, look, she's got the kids. You obviously got to leave her in the house. Like if you need a place to crash while you figure this out, like you're welcome here. And I kind of bounced around to a couple different spots until my friend that I'd mentioned that I'd met in basic training, um, his wife who he married shortly after we got to Luke. Um, they had a kid a few months after we had our second. And one day he came home to a note while his kids at daycare and says, I can't do this anymore. This isn't the life I wanted to have. Goodbye. And she got on a plane, flew back to North Carolina and he never saw her again and left it, left the kid there and everything. So he was like, um, well, my wife left me and just disappeared. So I have an extra room at the house. You're more than welcome to come move in with me and you can stay there rent free until you sell your house and you figure out what you're going to do. So we had equity in the house. We bought at a really good time. I think we had like, 60, 60 grand in equity. So it was like, okay, we had agreed as soon as the divorce is fine. Like we're going to try to sell the house in the meantime, but as soon as the divorce is finalized, we're going to put the house on the market. As soon as it sells, we'll split the equity 50, 50. I took all the, the debt and the divorce. I let her walk away scot-free with like almost 30 grand. And I figured like that was, I was trying not to lose custody of my kids. Mm -hmm. So if I can just give her as much as I possibly can, and maybe she'll be nice enough to like not try to take me for more, you know, take my kids for me type thing. So that my original plan, um, you know, I was in the air force and I was like, well, I don't want to leave it. Like I, 
after, you know, few years of this, I, I learned to enjoy my job. I became kind of good at it. I was, um, uh, a journeyman at that point. Um, going into the air force, were you thinking career initially? Yeah. I figured, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good retirement. I, I having a stepdad that was retired military, I had military medical retired military medical. So I knew that even like when, once you're a civilian, if you retire, you still have good medical, you know what I mean? Like it's not, it's, it's definitely better than VA medical, you know, but, uh, it's, it's good. You know, my parents still have it to this day and they take care of you. They always took care of me as a, as a teenager and stuff. So I just thought, you know, I wanted that for, for my, my kids. I know that your kids can be on it until they're like 23 or something. So I'm like, well, my kids will be at least covered medically until they're 23. And at that point they'll hopefully have figured out their own life and have their own medical and stuff. But like, yeah, that was my, my goal. Retire, have a, I, I went in so young. I was like, I'll be 38 when I retire. Um, you know, like maybe I can go get like a postal service job after that and just kind of roll that into that and just another government service job. And I'm like, you know, by the time I'm 30 years in, I'm like, I'll be set, you know, that was the plan. Um, and even when I got divorced, um, I initially had planned on staying, but I got orders to Korea and you can't take your family. So, um, I was like, well, I don't want to, I just got 50, 50 custody of my kids. My divorce was just finalized like a few months before this. I'm like, I don't want to give all that up. I don't want to go away for a year, have to turn over custody to my ex-wife. And then, you know, while I'm gone, she's plotting and planning and scheming to, to take full custody of my kids, you know, all together. Or where do I end up after Phoenix? You know, do I, do they let me go back to Phoenix? Cause usually they let you kind of pick your duty station after uh, um, a Korea deployment or, or relatively close to like, you know, your wish list of bases when you go into the military that from basic, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but after a Korea deployment, from my understanding, they actually take something like that into account. So I know guys when I was stationed at Luke that had done 16 of their 20 years at Luke because they had gone to Korea. They came back to Luke. They went to Korea. They came back to Luke. So it was just back and forth, back and forth. And it's like, that's where they wanted to go. That's where they did their almost their, their whole career at one base. So um, I thought, okay, I've got a shot at this, you know, my, is a career deployment always no family allowed to go or yes. just simply based on your rank? Um, I, I think officers can take family, um, but I think that's it. Um, I know NCOs that couldn't take family or anything like that too. It's just, it's a one year deployment. So it's, it's not even a deployment. You're, you're technically PCSing to a new base. It's just a one year assignment. Um, while you're there, you can still take leave and stuff like that, but they don't let you come back home for some reason. Like, I think you get to, I think one time you can come back home for less than a week or it's like five days or something like that. But I know people that like, while they were stationed in Korea, they went TDY to, or not TDY, they went, um, they took leave to Japan. They took leave to Australia. They took leave to New Zealand. Like they were all over the place. Just not back to the States. Just not back to the States. Yeah. Don't know it's why. the military. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure why that rule exists, but, um, so, you know, I, I, looking back in hindsight too, it's like maybe knowing what I know now, maybe I would have just gone to Korea. Maybe I would have chanced it. Do I get back to, to Arizona? Maybe I would have done the 20. I was just so afraid of losing my kids at that point. Um, did she stay in Arizona or go back to California? So I got out. She got an apartment after we sold the house. I think she paid her lease six months up front. And I, I was actually, at this time I was still in. So I was paying for childcare. Um, she was living in like a really crappy apartment, like near downtown Phoenix. I was living in like Glendale area, um, which was closer to the base. So I'd have to drive away from work, pick my kids up, drive towards work, drop them off at the daycare and then drive to work. And then after come pick them up and we'd split it to where it was like, I had my kids Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. She took them Wednesday night. She had them Thursday, Friday or no, I had them Tuesday, Wednesday. She had them Thursday, Friday. And then no, I had them Monday, Tuesday. She had them Wednesday, Thursday. We split every Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So every other weekend you'd have them for the whole weekend. So every other weekend I'd have them, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Then the then she would have them Thursday, Friday. You get it. There would be times where I would show up to her apartment and uh, like let's say to pick the kids up 
and the kids wouldn't be ready. Like she wouldn't even it'd be early. It'd be like five 30 in the morning, but it's like, you know, I'm coming. She didn't have a job. So it's like, you, you don't just please have them ready for me. So I, I'm going to be late to work and it's not like being late to work at bank of America. Right. I'm late to the military. It's a whole <laughs> thing. So please don't do this to me. And then there would be times where I would have to drop them off before I went to work to, to drop them off to her. And I would get to her apartment and I would knock and she wouldn't answer. And then I'm like, dude, is she even awake yet? And then I'm like, is she even home? And I would call herself when she's like, Oh, I'm on, on my way home right now. I'm like, what? Like, are you, are you coming home drunk still? Like you're long story, but um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a logistical nightmare, but she stayed in Arizona for a little while. Was then, she from the San Diego area? Yeah, yeah. So then maybe like four months into it, she starts, she's going back home a lot to, to San Diego to be with her family and stuff. And she meets a guy in San Diego and she's like, she hits me up like right before Thanksgiving. And she's like, I want to move back to San Diego. I want to talk to you about like splitting the kids where like they'll stay with me for a month and they'll come stay with you for a month. Then they'll stay with me for a month and they'll come stay with you for a month. And I'm like, no, like that's, can't do that to our kids. You know what I mean? Like that's just that constant moving back for even when they're that young, it's just, that's, it's too much for them. Like, no, I, I, I do not accept this. And I said, the only way that you're moving back to San Diego, cause she, technically she couldn't leave the state with the kids without my permission. I said, the only way you're moving back to San Diego is if you give me the kids. She's like, fine. She gave me the kids. So I got a not, not on paper. She just gave me the kids. I, I should have gone to court at that point and I should have done all that, but it didn't happen. She moves back to San Diego. She Hindsight's meets, 2020 with a magnifying glass. I know. I know. She meets this guy. They get married. Six months later, they get divorced. So she's, um, at that time, I'm dating somebody pretty, uh, seriously. And she's becoming close with my children and whatnot. And I get switched to swing shift. Thankfully at that time I was in this relationship cause they told me like, you don't have an option. Like we don't care that you have your kids and that you don't have a wife or anything like that. Like you got to figure it out. So at the time I, I, I talked to my girlfriend about it and whatnot. We'd been together like maybe four or five months and she's just like, like, yeah, like I can, I'll, I'll watch your kids, you know, while you go to work at night and swing shift for my job was weird. It was either cause the flying schedule constantly changes. So that means that our schedules always change week by week. So sometimes I'd go in if we were like regular flying, I'd go in at like five and you stay depending on what needs to be done. So if there's no jets that are broken, then you can probably leave early. I might be out of there by like nine o'clock. I might be there for just a couple hours. If I go in there and there's something that's really, really broke and I have to fix it because it's on the, the schedule for flights the next day, it's like I might be there till two or three in the morning and then I'm calling in the day shift early to come, you know, uh, do transition with me. Like we'll go over what, you know, we, Hey, we troubleshoot all the way up to here. This is where you guys are going to be starting for, you know, moving forward from. Um, and then that happened pretty often because these jets are old and broken. Um, but not all the time. So swings was an experience, but it wasn't a terrible one. It wasn't nearly as bad. Thankfully I had somebody that, that had my back. Um, that relationship ended up not working out. And, um, at that point, um, and that, and that was, I was coming towards the end of my, um, military stay at that point. I tried to cross train. I tried to get another job. Um, and I just didn't make the cutoff deadline. Another job within the air force. Within the air force. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, at that point I called my parents up and I was like, Hey, um, I'm getting out of the military. I've got these kids who knows where their mom's at. Um, she was just really not in the picture at the time. Um, I'd really like to, um, like, can I bring them to stay with you guys while I figure out what I'm doing next? And this is where my transition to civilian life starts to happen. And it's just kind of a shit show at that point. Just taking one quick step back again, the, the motivation to cross train was that so that you could stay in. I mean, what was, what was yeah. the driving force? Yeah. yeah. If I could stay in and, and get a different job, um, that was maybe not so, um, deployment heavy. Got it. Then, um, I would have stayed in. Got it. From my under, from what, from what I had been told by all of the NCOs that, that were in my career field, you know, like Luke is kind of a rare thing. Um, it's a training pace. You don't deploy because if they deploy, then who's going to train the new guys. So the only time we had like 
you know, TDYs or anything like that is if it was like for an exercise. So we'd go to like Vegas once a year. So they would do like the F 16s versus the F 15s at Nellis. And then we would do like a, a deployment every couple of years to new Orleans. And we'd uh, go, um, they, they would go head to head with F 18s uh, at a Navy base there. And then they would do Hawaii every year. And then they would do like cold Lake Canada and, it was just like just exercises. We would like our pilots are going to go up there and compete against these guys and like a, some games and see, you know, who comes out on top. And, you know, you're just there to maintenance the jets while they're there. But no, like deployment, deployment, unless you wanted to. So if you were coming up on a reenlistment and you wanted to deploy to the desert for tax free status on your reenlistment, they would let you temporarily assign to another squadron that was deployed and they would send you out there and you would just kind of fill in. Um, so that was the only like, so I was like, okay, Luke is a relatively stable base. Like, let's see if I can get, if I can't stay here, like maybe I can get a more job that, or a job that's more stable than I'm not going to deploy with. Maybe I can get, maybe I can get that networking job or something Got like it. that. So I went and looked at it stuff and I just, I didn't make the cutoff. So it was like getting out was happening and, and it was happening quick. Um, like my, is this 2005? E 2006. Okay. Um, the very, like, or actually, yeah, December, 2005. So they're like, Hey, um, we signed you up for these, uh, these classes. You, they're like a week long, couple hours a day, but they're like on transitioning out and they were worthless. Um, it was like how to write a resume and like, um, you know, like how to deal with like leaving to, you know, leaving the military. And at that point I hadn't been in that long. So it wasn't like a detrimental thing to me. Um, what I've heard is the, the transition programs are great if you know what you're transitioning into. Yeah. If you don't have an idea where you want to end up sitting through a resume class going, what am I writing a resume for? Right. Right. Well, so, okay. Um, I'm stationed in, in Phoenix and the Phoenix PD came in and they spoke to us and I was like, okay, maybe I'll go law enforcement. Like, so I sign up for that. I go in, I take the test. Uh, there's a couple hundred people there um, in this big building in downtown Phoenix. I pass the test. Um, they then sign me up for, not sign me up, but uh, give me a time for, to come in for like a, like a physical test, like run a mile, jump over a wall, push up setups, things like that. I pass that. And then it comes, they hand me the background packet and I am deathly afraid to take this thing because when I was, I'd, when I was 21, my dad came out to visit my wife and I, and he, my dad is a, a big pothead. And I was like, I've never smoked weed before. And he's like, oh, you should. And I'm like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Like, I don't, I don't know how, you know? So he like blows, I get high, you know, but I was still in the military. So I was like super quiet about it. I didn't tell anybody anything. And I was like, and nobody, nobody in the military ever found out about it. I never did it again. It was just literally that one time, but I was afraid that, cause they were like, okay, if you've done cocaine in the last seven years, you can't, you're not qualified. I'm okay. Well, I've never done that. And I'm like, if you've done acid or any psychedelics, you're not qualified period. I'm like, okay, well, I've never done that. And they're like, if you've ever smoked weed in the last three years and I'm like, I don't know, it's been <laughs> two and a half, maybe it's been three. I don't know. I'm freaking out. I don't even fill out the packet. I was like, I guess that's just the end of it there. And then I have people now that tell me like, dude, you should just fill it out. Like it, they wouldn't have get, if you just would have been honest with them and told them they probably would not have given a shit. And I'd probably had been, been a cop, but I was like deathly afraid. I'm like, if they find out, you know, what's going to happen? Am I going to get arrested? You know, I had no clue. So the woulda, coulda, shoulda's in right. life. And at that point, it's like, if I'm that, that was the only, I had no plan that I had 30 grand in the bank from selling the house. Um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Then I, 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 I got a, a job offer um, to go work for Lockheed Martin. Cause there's like a Phoenix is a big uh, hub. Um, so I was going to work for Lockheed Martin at like one of the facilities out there, like essentially working at a call center where if another hub calls you for a part and you have it in your inventory, you like express ship it to them. Cause they've got to get that jet back. Uh, in the air. And so I was like, okay, well, they're like, well, you know, aircraft maintenance. I'm essentially just working in supply for an aircraft company. And, um, I, uh, I, I aced the interview. I got the job offer. They sent me down for a drug test and I hadn't done, I was going to pass that. No problem. I went on vacation to go home to visit my mom for a week and I made it back like a day late and I didn't take the drug test. And I called and I was super apologetic. I'm super sorry. They're like, no, we already offered to somebody else. I'm like, so like there was my, 
I kind of screwed that up. So it was like, now what do I do? And I had a friend that I was in the military with and his girlfriend worked at macaroni grill. And he's like, dude, go be a server. Like it's something, you know, it'll make you some money while you figure out what the heck you want to do next. I've, is it not common or am I misunderstanding? So you come out after four years, you've got a, a huge skill set working on these jets to not basically turn around and go back in as a contractor doing the same thing. So, um, yes, that can be an option. However, um, it wasn't, I, right around the time I was getting out is when the air force was realizing because of September 11th, our numbers are so padded. Like we have so many people that are in now we've got to start getting rid of people. So first they, um, they offered, Hey, if you want to get out, like if you just, if you're just tired of being in the military and you want to get out early and you don't want to retire and you don't want to wait till your, your contract's up, like go, you know, come talk to us. We'll let you go. So they did that and it wasn't enough people. And then they started kicking people out. Like, you're kind of a shitbird. You're out of here. You know, you, you've got a bunch of DUIs. You're out of here. They started doing that and it still wasn't enough. So they were like force shrinking their numbers down. So they started limiting, um, the amount of promotions. So if you, they used to say like, okay, if you're in this career field and you're going to test for staff sergeant, um, you know, we're going to promote 300 people. Then it would shrunk to like 75, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay, well you didn't promote. So you know, you're kind of like, there's a watchful eye on you. Why didn't you promote? You know what I mean? If you miss enough promotions, eventually they boot you. So around this time, a lot of people are leaving and they're going to work as contractors for like the Singapore squadron. And there was another squadron like that on our base. So that my option, I missed that boat. You know what I mean? There, there's these guys that are 10 years into my career field with much more experience. Right. that are going and taking those jobs versus my four. So yeah, I, I wish that was an option, but it wasn't. Um, and then to do it in the civilian sector, you need uh, an A and P license, an aircraft and power plant license, and that requires even though you've been doing the job, you have to go to schooling, essentially at like a, something like an Ember Riddle Aeronautical uh, University and get like an engineering degree, and then you can go be that in the civilian sector. Oh damn! Yeah, so it's like a whole nother thing, and I'm like, I'm not trying to go back to college to do what I've just been doing for the last four years. Like that makes no sense, and I don't have the money for. And the GI Bill sucked then because it wasn't the post 9-11 one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when did uh, that kick in? <clears throat> like a month after I graduated from my trade school. <laughs> yeah. So my, my GI, for those of you that, that, that know the old 9-11, I used to get like a monthly stipend, but like that was it. I had to pay for the schooling out of pocket and all that stuff. And then literally a month after I graduated trade school for what I do now, uh, they, the post 9-11 kicked in and I'm like, oh, they pay for schooling and they pay you a stipend. I'm like, man, I really <laughs> screwed that one. I should have waited a year, you know? So. So the end of 2005, you're cycling out. Yeah. Your plan is you start talking to your parents about possibly coming back to San Diego. So essentially my parents took my kids while I figured out back in Phoenix, what was going on. I didn't want to leave Phoenix. That's where my court order was, even though my wife had left. And I, I liked it there. Like it was affordable and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I the possibility of buying Nice and house. cool in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't, I worked outside on jets all the time, sitting in jet exhaust. I, I got used to that. But um, yeah, so my kids went and stayed with my parents for a couple of months. And my plan was to figure out what I was going to do. Like I got two, three months, figure out what we're going to do. What, let's find a job. Let's find something, you know? And uh, I kind of just spiraled out of control and I, I'm not, I'm not making an excuse or anything. I never really, I went from being like a child essentially to having a kid joining the military and being a husband and a father. There was no like wild time in my teens or like partying like in college. And so I never had any of that. So once I got a divorce and I didn't have my kids to watch after and I had a bunch of money in the bank, I went wild. Um, and I did that for a long time. Now my kids were with my parents for a little less than a year. Um, my ex-wife uh, was seeing them, even though she lived in San Diego, my kids were in San Diego with my parents. She saw them like once a month for a couple of days at a time. And um, I was seeing them more than that. I was going back home every other weekend to San Diego to see my kids. And um, she took them for a visit. And it was supposed to be a couple of days, maybe a week or something like that. And 
my mom called me on the phone. She's like, Hey, I haven't heard from kid's mom. Uh, I don't know when they're coming back. She goes, it's not a big deal. I'm totally fine with them being with, with her, but I I've got appointments and things I need to plan around. So if like, if she wants to bring them back on a Wednesday and I've got something, I might not be available. So I just want to make sure I'm available. So I call her up and I'm like, Hey, mom's just curious. Like when you're going to take the kids back over there, she's just trying to figure out her schedule for the week. Oh, you know, just a couple more days. I'm like, okay. Uh, more, a little more time goes by. Mom calls me again. Hey, I haven't heard anything. I'm like, okay, I'll call again. Call her again. She's like, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll take it back tomorrow. I was like, okay, again, no, nobody's tripping. Just some communication would be nice so she can figure out what, she, what she's doing with her week. Yeah, no big deal. And then a couple of days later, I get a phone call. I'm sorry, I get a text message from her mom, from my ex-wife's mom. It says, the kids are safe. They're not in San Diego anymore. Um, that's all you need to know. And I was like, uh-uh. So I picked the phone up. And I recall my mother, ex mother in law's cell phone number out of memory, even though it's a number I have not dialed in years. I call her on the phone. She answers, and I don't think she's expecting my voice. I said, You have 24 hours to let me know where my children are. I want a phone number and I want an address, and I want to talk to them. Otherwise, I will, you know, I will file charges against your daughter for kidnapping. Um, and you will never see those children again. I said, I will personally make sure that you never are in their life after that point. Two minutes, and I hang up the phone. I don't even talk to her. A couple minutes later, I get a phone call from my ex-wife. She's like, hey, we're really sorry, blah, blah, blah. She tells me that she moved to Colorado. That's where her family's from. She's living with her uncle. She has an opportunity to go to school for, like, nursing or something like that. And uh, she took the kids with her, and and I'm like, look, dude, if you would have, like, talked to me. me. Yeah, <laughs> that you had a plan, and that, like, when, when we got divorced, we always agreed, like, the kids will be with whoever is most stable. Well, when you walked away and went to go marry this guy in San Diego and wanted to bail, you weren't the most stable. So I took them. And then when I wasn't stable anymore and I needed to figure out what was going on and you clearly weren't stable because nobody knew where the hell you were at, they went with my parents because that was the next best step. So if you are getting your stuff together and you're figuring out your plan for what's next, I would have been fine with that. But you could have done this. And she's like, you're super apologetic. Yeah, I know you're right. You're absolutely right. Da, 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 da. I'm like, okay. So let me talk to them. I talked to the kids. They seem fine. They're young at the time. They're like three and a half and two and a half. Um, and uh, I was like, okay, I guess my, lids, my kids live in Colorado now. And at that point, um, my time in Phoenix was coming to an end. Just kind of felt stuck. Felt like I couldn't figure out life. And I was like, I got to move. And, um, I never wanted to come back to San Diego. I didn't want to work for my parents. They, they owned a business building swimming pool. That's what, what I kind of did growing up, you know, as an early teen, they would take me to work. I learned that trade and I'm like, I don't, I just didn't want to be the guy that worked for his mom and dad. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to kind of figure out my own stuff. So call my dad up and we're not super close, um, at that time, but, uh, we're not, we don't speak at all now. And, uh, I'm like, Hey, this is biological dad who yes. lived in Northern California. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, I've never lived in Northern California. It's been a long time since I've been there. Um, I'd like to come up there and give it a shot. Like, what are your thoughts? He's like, absolutely. So he helped me find a place to move into. Um, packed all my stuff in a U-Haul, sold a bunch of stuff I didn't want to move with. And I moved to, uh, Sacramento and, um, he helped me find a job. I got a job as a bartender. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. And that is a really kind of, it can be, I guess, a dark and, and lonely lifestyle. You work in like dive bars and stuff like that. Like you have screwed up sleeping schedule and your hours are messy. And the only people that you really interact with are drunks and other people that work in your industry. And um, you start to drink a lot because that's just, what you do. It's what everybody does. Nobody's really a sober bartender that I've ever met. And, uh, it, it wasn't like an alcoholism bout or anything like that. It's just like, you know, what else am I going to do? It's what everybody else is doing. Once I got out of bartending, I, I still partied and I still drank and stuff like that, but I, not to the level that I was drinking again. I don't think there was any sort of like a chemical dependency there, which is weird because my family is loaded with alcoholics, but, um, just yeah. more an environmental. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was like, uh, I didn't get out of bartending until I, I saw a commercial one day 
right? Um, it's 26 for UTI for trade school on like learning body work. And I'm like, oh, that seems cool. You know, I have an artistic side. I like to paint cars. And I went down there and I toured the school and uh, I liked it. I liked the program. And they really kind of talk it up. This is like during the recession. So they're kind of explaining like, you know, people aren't buying new cars or fixing what they have. And, you know, the, the industry is booming for us. So this is the time to get in and sell you this whole story. And, um, you know, I'm still in the industry to this day, but it, it definitely wasn't what they told me it was going to be. <laughs> and another uh, recruiter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Essentially that, there's my recruiter experience. Cause my first one was just like, cool, you're signing up here. Sign, you know, but, um, yeah, I signed up and, uh, I put myself in some financial aid debt um, that I'm still paying off to this day. And, um, but I, I have my career and it, it took me that long to kind of figure out what I was going to be. Like I didn't know it was just a lost soul kind of like, you know, trying to figure out what my purpose was. Um, I had two kids and is UTI largely like paint and body training. So they've got multiple programs. So started out initially as like uh, mechanics. So then they've got all these like factory partnerships with like Toyota and Mercedes, Nissan, um, to where you can go through their main schooling and then you can do, you can tack on like additional electives after you, you pass through your schooling. So like, I want to go be, um, I want to be a Toyota tech. So you do their, your, the year mechanic program and then you go do like another six months at a Toyota specific program. And then you graduate and now you have a Toyota certification, which makes getting a dealership job that much easier. So I initially did that for the bodywork side. Um, cause they have a, they have the bot, the mechanic side, they have a bodywork side, not at every location. They have locations all over the country, but their main, um, is the mechanic stuff. The, there's like a long beach location that does bodywork. There's a Sacramento location that does bodywork. And there's like, I think the Phoenix, Arizona one does bodywork. Then they also have the MMI, which is the Motorcycle Mechanics Institute, which is a part of the same company that's located in Phoenix. And then like, I think in like West Virginia or something like that, there's another location, but they are specific to racing. So like if you want to be a NASCAR mechanic, you go through their regular mechanic program, then you transfer to that school and you learn like the, the hot rod side of things or the NASCAR side of things. What do they, what do they cost? Like what's that one of those programs run? When I did it, I think, I, I think I'm like 35 grand, something like that. So pretty expensive. And how yeah. long, how long is the program a take? Year. And you leave with a bunch of certifications, but they tell you like, if you want to be a body man, like now, like let's say you're 18 years old and you want to go be a body man or you want to be a painter. The traditional way is you go work at a shop as like a guy washing cars or cleaning up the shop or whatever. And you show that you have a work ethic and you, you build relationships and rapport with the people that work in that shop. And maybe a body man takes you under his wing. You apprentice under him for a couple of years. He, you, your pay is out of his paycheck. So he pays you an hourly wage, maybe 15 bucks an hour, 16 bucks an hour. And he decides if you're going to get a raise or whatnot, depending on, you know, how well you're advancing. And then after about three to four years of that, making, you know, essentially pennies, um, but you're learning, you're being paid to learn. Then you go off on your own. When that, when that guy says, Hey, he can do everything that I can do. Maybe not as fast, but he's more than proficient and he's not going to butcher a car. And I feel confident giving him my stamp of approval. Um, then you go off on your own and then you can, you can usually get a job maybe in the same shop <clears throat> as an hourly technician until your speed picks up. And then you go to like a flag rate where you can make real money. So. Do you, are you still seeing that seems for this generation today, that doesn't seem like what a lot of them want to do. No, no. I, 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 I talked to my, I have two older children. I have a 21 year old and obviously the ones I had in my first marriage, 21 and, and 19. And, um, I was really not trying to push, but just like letting them know when they were like 14, 15 years old, I was like, Hey, like I, I know you go to public school. And I know public school is going to tell you, go to college, go to college, go to college. That's all they ever told me. I didn't know trade schools were a thing. And I'm like, but there's jobs out there that don't require college education. You go to a trade school, you learn the trade, and you will make way more money than you make from any of these jobs that you're going to go to college for. Um, are you going to end up a CEO of a major corporation going to a trade school? Not likely. 
Um, are you going to end up the CEO of a, of a major corporation going to college? Also not likely, you know, um, you're not, are you going to end up in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt going to college? Very possibly. Are you going to do that going to trade school? No, you know, usually you get paid while you're going. And usually when you graduate, you're making six figures off the jump. So I'm like, nobody told me, Kenny, go learn to be a welder. Right. You know, when I was 17 years old, nobody said, Hey, go learn to be an electrician. You know what I mean? I have friends that make a quarter million dollars a year doing, uh, you know, highline electrician work and have been making that money for like the last 15 years. And nobody told me that that was a possibility. Um, you know, so I, I learned about trade schools when I was in my twenties, you know, and, uh, I don't make 250 grand a year, <laughs> but, but I, I definitely make more than I would have if I just stayed bartending. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I just, I don't think high schools push that at all, you know, unless you go to like, um, like a job fair or something like that, where there's a, you know, it happens to be a trade school or something like that. And I think there's a lot of, um, uh, predatory schools out there, like these private institutions, less UTI, more like the, you know, art institutes and things like that. It's like, oh, you can get a degree in graphic design and it's like, it's a, it, you can't get rid of those loans and they'll tack onto your credit and just, you know, ruin you. And it's like, you're not, most people aren't getting jobs, um, that are making enough money to pay those loans off uh, out of those schools. So it just seems kind of dirty to me. With now having kids who are off to college. Yeah. As a parent, we, there, there's so many facets to this. You're a parent now with, with kids who are growing up. You've got the one aspect that you want to give them your knowledge and experience from your laps around the sun. At the same token, the other part of being a parent is figure out who you are. Go, yeah. go become your own person. But as, a, as an overall whole, every parent does this. Just go to college. Go to college. Yeah. But no, no, myself included, even though we try, do you sit down and expose your kids? Hey, that's a high line electrician guy. He can make X number of dollars. We don't expose them to all the potentials that are out there. Right. Unless they're driven by one particular thing. Yeah. It's um, every, I have three daughters. They're all completely different personalities. My, my oldest can be a little stubborn, but she's a lot like me. She's a neat freak. She's very um, particular. Everything is organized. Um, we've bonded a lot in her adult years, and I, I try to try to learn this balancing act of sharing information and knowledge with her without coming off too much like dad or being preachy. And it's a tough line to walk. Um, I think um, I think she's getting to the point where she's experienced a little bit of struggle as an adult and she kind of understands, you know, maybe dad knows a little bit about what he's talking about, but um, I, it's, it's a tough one. Like it, it doesn't matter how much I, I tell any of my kids like do this or do that. Like um, there's always going to be that pushback there. It's just like, and I remember that. I mean, I was probably mid twenties before I, kind of just realized like my parents are just ultimate, like, like I, you don't, it's up to them to figure out how to like turn you, you down a little bit and, mm -hmm. you know, in their own head. Like I know my dad means well, and I know he's not trying to be super pushy and I know he's not trying to dictate how I need to do things. He's just trying to avoid me headache in the future. Um, so I think my, my oldest is starting to get that. Um, my youngest is five. So no, <laughs> But yeah, I, um, I think too, with, with my, my current child, my youngest child, because, um, she's actually growing up in a two parent household. Um, and it's not, uh, like we're really supportive, my wife and I of, of what the other person has to say or how they feel and whatnot. So we kind of, we, <clears throat> we're partners. Um, whereas single parent households, it's kind of a lot of fighting back and forth and you never know what your ex is saying to your children when you're not around. So I think this time around is going to be a little easier because I don't have any intentions of leaving my wife and I don't think she has any intentions of leaving me, at least that I'm aware of. So 
it's amazing what maturity brings to yeah. being a parent. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, um, I don't know. I don't know. My, my ex-wife is, and I'm not trying to bash on her. I know that she's not the most motivated individual. Um, and I think my oldest is starting to recognize that, you know, that there's a, there's a difference. Like there's a reason why dad has what he has and mom has what she has. And it's because dad has never stopped working. You know, that's even in, in all my years of being lost and, um, ignoring responsibility and whatnot. I, I've never have been the type to have borrowed money from my parents, but I pay them back. Like my mom's big on that. Like it's never, she, it's, she's never gifted me money. Um, it's, uh, I won't say never, but it's not a, a thing, you know, she, she'll loan me money. I'll pay her back. It's never an exorbitant amount. It's like, Hey, I need to, you know, I need to pay a cell phone bill or something like that. I'm, I'm broke. Um, as I've gotten older, that, that doesn't happen anymore. I just, I've become more responsible and I credit a lot of that just to the fact that I'm, I have other people to, to worry about now, you know? Um, I've always had my kids, but it's like, I hate to, it, it pains me to admit this, but the out of sight, out of mind aspect, like it's not like we even lived in the same city and I had them all the time. It's like essentially I became my father. I had them during summer breaks. I had them on Christmas. And when I was around my children, I gave them 100% of my attention. And I, um, I would tell my friends like, you know, Hey, my kids are coming to visit me for, for the summer. I'm, I'm going to be a ghost. You will not hear from me. I, I will not be out. Like my kids, are getting 100% of my time. Um, but when they're not around the other 10 months of the year, it's like, I, I, I was just a single man. Um, and it, I'm not, it, it, I regret that. You know what I mean? I should have, I should have been more mindful with my money or, or try to be more responsible and, and try to place my children's, um, needs made them more of a priority um even though they weren't around you know what i mean um but now having my current wife and my current child they're in my house every day i come home it's a constant reminder you know that other people rely on me and when i met my wife um in 2015 um and i i met her and like a month later i moved from northern california down here to be closer to her and, uh, I, I have never left since. And it, it's just been, um, I don't, I don't party. I don't drink. I don't, I don't do any drugs. It's not because I couldn't just the desire is completely gone. Um, the desire to, to go out and be at a bar with friends until two o'clock in the morning and then go, go to someone's house afterwards and continue to party. It doesn't exist anymore. And I still have friends that live in Northern California that do those things. And, um, I'm thankful that I got out of there and I was able to kind of break that, that cycle. Cause it was, um, just like repetitive and just never changed. And, um, and I, I could still be doing that to this day and I'm not because, I found my purpose and my purpose is to be a husband, to be a father, to be a good example. And I've worked really hard to kind of patch a relationship with my older children. Um, I've admitted to them that, you know, I wasn't the most, uh, uh, present father. Um, you know, especially in times when I could be, and there's things that break my heart that I can't take back, you know, like, my, my oldest, when she was in high school, she started playing sports and it's like, I never saw a single sports game. I didn't get to go to graduation cause COVID. Um, I, I didn't, there's so many like instrumental, like moments in, in their lifetime or, you know, these, uh, milestones that I missed that I almost feel guilty that I'm not missing them now with my youngest. Um, and like I harbored like this this insane amount of like regret and like uh, guilt because my daughter, my youngest, does have me around every day, and 
my wife works weekends and I spend every Saturday and Sunday, I wake up and I make my kid breakfast and we hang out on the couch and we draw and we color. And I didn't get to do that with my younger kids. Um, so there's, it's like, I do these things with my kid and I'm super appreciative that I have that opportunity. But then like, there'll be times where it'll hit me. Like I didn't get to do this with Trinity and I didn't get to do this with harmony. And <clears throat> a lot of that's my fault. You know, I didn't move them to Colorado. So it didn't make it, you know, that didn't make it easier. But like I, when I got out of the military, I should have had a plan and I should have been thinking about somebody other than myself. And I shouldn't have gotten lost in these like selfish desires to like <clears throat> party and like be that guy. And, um, I used to tell myself like, Oh, I don't have any regrets about that. Like definitely, you know, I, I could have done things better, but I don't have any regrets about it. Cause you know, otherwise I would regret that I didn't do those things. And it's like, not necessarily. I definitely regret that. I definitely have regrets. I definitely I am who I am today because of the experiences that I experienced, but my children are the, are the people they are today because of my experiences that I experienced that, that I didn't include them in or, or that I ignored them for. And, um, you know, when I see my kids struggle with certain things, like I, a, a lot of that blame lays on me and like, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't know, put myself into like a, a de- pressure or a spiral because of it but I definitely acknowledge the fact that like my kids struggle because I didn't have discipline and self-control and I didn't uh have a plan and uh and I could have been better and they could be struggling struggling less if I um if I had been better in the past but you know I can't change the past I just I got to make sure I don't make that mistake again with what I currently am so that's kind of where I'm at in life now is just trying to be as best of a person as I can is, is most open-minded of a person as I can. Um, I try to, uh, I don't know, um, be as thoughtful and, and just, I know I'm also getting to the point where like I'm middle of my life and that also life could end any day at the same time. Like the, I, I, I might not be middle-aged. I might've been middle-aged when I was 25 cause I might only make it to 50. So it's like, am I doing everything to maximize my impact on those around me now? And I used to fear before I met my wife, <clears throat> I used to fear that like when I was in my late twenties, like if I died today, would, would people show up to my funeral? Like would, would it just be my parents? Would my, would my kids show up, you know, um, what friends would actually come, you know, who, who's actually my friend, who would actually give, who's going to fly across the country to pay their respects and say goodbye. And, uh, there was points in time where I was like, fuck nobody, you know, um, I, I, I truly doubted that. And, um, I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, I work really hard to, to be as helpful as I can. Um, I understand that there's certain talents or like skills that I have that I can use to show appreciation to friends or somebody's getting into something that I know a lot about. It's like, let me help you out, you know, um, for nothing other than like the enjoyment of it for sharing that passion. Um, but also, I don't know, maybe it'll, it'll, it'll pay off someday for them and they'll pay it forward to, to the next person in line or something like that. So, um, what I find happiness and, uh, fulfillment in now is a lot different than my early twenties. And, uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. It's a, it's a term that gets thrown around and definitely overused. We don't, there is no, there's no owner's manual. There's no instruction manual to being a parent. And every one of us comes to being a parent with only one set of experiences. And that's what we experienced as kids growing up. And unfortunately, and I am in that same boat with you. And I'm sure there's other people listening to this who are in that exact same boat. 
got married, got divorced, and it had an impact on our kids. And we could sit here today and say, I regret A, I regret B. Yes, we all have regrets. The thing I say to myself is when you realize that day, when you realize it's my job to be a parent, as long as from that day forward, you're doing everything you can to be the best parent you can to rehab relationships with your kids, you're doing everything that you can. Now, if you make that realization, you spend that time and look in the mirror and go, wow, I could do A, B, and C better, but you still choose to continue making those, I'll call them mistakes, then that's where you're failing as a parent. But if you make the realization and you gather that maturity, you gather that time of laps around the sun, hey, this is what I have to do as a parent, and from that day forward, your drive and your decisions are for what's best for your children, there's nothing more you can do. I say, there are, we all have woulda, coulda, shouldas in our life. I get that. I would not change any decision that I've made that would impact where I'm at sitting here today, sitting across this table talking with you, because my life today is great. I have great children. I have a great wife. I have a a good job. I have a, a podcast that has truly become a passion project of mine. Anything that I could go, if you gave me any opportunity to go back in my past and redo even just one thing would totally impact where I'm at today. And who knows if it would be this a better or, or worse. And so I don't, I'm not trying to say that I don't think about the decisions I've made in the past. I just say, I made those mistakes as long as I don't keep making them, then I'm succeeding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lesson I I've tried to teach my, all my kids and it's, uh, the remorse lesson or, or truly being sorry. And I always say, like, if you're truly sorry for something you did, you won't do it again. And if you do do it again, you're kind of wiping that apology away. And, uh, yeah, that's it's definitely something that I kind of live by and um, constantly think about. Like, if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to do something that I knowingly, if I'm going to do something shitty and I'm consciously thinking about it, then I won't do it. You know, whereas in my past, I would just do shitty things. Because you were just thinking about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's bring it a little bit lighter. How we met on the mats. Yeah. Talk to me about your journey into jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was exposed to grappling, wrestling in high school. I mentioned my stepdad was a um, uh, a wrestler in high school and, and uh, went into wrestling in the army. And... Um, he was like a, a military, like a all military champion, um, in the seventies, eighties. And, uh, he always had like a, a passion for it. And, and that art, that high school I went to that art school. So that was, a uh, that school was sixth grade through 12th grade. I went there seventh, eighth and ninth. One of the things that they did that was really neat. This is my exposure into the martial arts and to all that stuff was one of the teachers there. One of the history teachers for the high school was a black belt in Taekwondo. So they allowed him in lieu of PE to teach Taekwondo classes. So I took Taekwondo from seventh, eighth and ninth grade. Now this is early nineties and this is when UFC is just coming about. So I'd say my second year, he starts talking about this UFC fighting stuff and, and, um, and I'd already been watching with my stepdad because he's he's all about it. These wrestlers are coming in, they're dominating, and he's just like, you know, I've I've thought about this my whole life, and I always knew wrestling was a martial art, and nobody ever gave it credit. And he's just like, you know, standing on top of that hill, like Mark Coleman, Dan Fry, like, <laughs> yeah, he's stoked. So, um, my teacher, um, starts taking jujitsu lessons, uh, from a gentleman named Fabio Santos in San Diego which I believe is who Jocko has his black belt through. And 
he convinces a school to let us uh, go on a field trip and take like a, like a couple hour seminar. So that was like the first time jujitsu touched me. And it was like, I wished when I was a 14, 15 year old boy that like, I could have jumped into it then. Where would I be now in the sport? You know? And it was one of those things. And I wrestled a little Says bit. Says absolutely no one who does jujitsu. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I would have started. Yeah. <laughs> so I, um, between, I wrestled for a season. Um, and then I did that, the, just the Taekwondo and that one little seminar. And it was, it's always something that's like, it's always been in the back of my head. And I've, I've been in fights. I've been at, I've been in at, at parties with people like a, a good friend of mine. He's a, a wrestling coach in Northern California now. And I remember we were at a party one time and he wrestled all through high school and he wrestled in the Navy and he was all about it. And we wrestled in the, in the living room and I took his back and I choked him and he was like blown away. And like, I didn't, again, admittedly had very much grappling experience at all. Just what I learned really stuck with me and I could scramble. So, um, little moments like that where I was like, man, this, this, this really works. Like, and I remember when I, the first body shop I ever worked in, I remember a guy coming in to get his car fixed and I remember seeing geese in his car and I'm like, this guy just jujitsu. I should ask him about it. I should ask him about it. And I didn't. And I'm like, that was 27. And then I'd, I'd looked into like jujitsu lessons around that time. And I'm like, they're so expensive, you know? And I'm like, you know, it's a hundred and 150 bucks a month. And I'm like, that's, I, I can't afford that. And I'm like, I spend that at the bar. I was going to say, dump that on a yeah. Saturday night. Of course I can afford that. I just, I would have to make a sacrifice <laughs> and I just wasn't ready, you know? And, um, then when I moved, uh, down here and I met my wife and, um, I met Jason. So Jason and my wife have been friends for like 20 years. And I think Jason at the time was a purple belt. And she's like, Oh yeah, my friend Jason does jujitsu. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. You know, and I didn't think anything of it. I was like, Oh yeah, he does jujitsu. And then, uh, 2017, um, I saw, I was watching a lot of the Joe Rogan podcasts and I became really uh, familiar with Eddie Bravo and his 10th planet schools. And then I saw an advertisement on Facebook for a 10th planet school that was opening up in Murrieta. And I was like, Oh, okay. Like, that'll be fun. I'll try that out. So I got a hold of them. I signed up for a month. Um, I was working in, uh, Elsinore at the time at a body shop and I lived in Wildemar. So I'm like, it's a little past my house. I'll just, I'll, I'll, it's the next exit. I'll just go there. I'll, I'll do the class. I'll come home. At that time, I was already going to the gym with my wife, like pretty, like five, six days a week. Every single day after work, I'd go straight to the gym, which was in Marietta. She would come from the barbershop in Temecula to the gym in Marietta. We'd meet up there, work out for a couple hours, go home. So like I was already like in the mindset of like being active and, and you know, fitness and all that stuff. And and we didn't have a, a baby at the time or anything like that. So like that was what, how we spent our evenings, early evenings before dinner and going home. So then I started doing, I started going to the 10th planet and I, and I really enjoyed it. And, um, I got, I left that shop and I, I transferred to the company that I'm at now and it was a shop in Temecula. So I'm like, okay, so now I live in Wildemar. It's on the way home. Sweet. Uh, then we, a couple months later, we moved to Temecula. So now I'm like, I'm driving from Temecula or from, from my house to work in Temecula out to Marietta and then back to my house. Like it's just, I'm driving past my house. It became inconvenient. <laughs> My shop was two, two blocks away from Dan Henderson's. Um, and that's where Jason was training at the time. Cause that's where Poncho was. And, um, and so I signed up there. I was like, uh, you know, let me get this ski stuff a try. And I'd already done at that point, like maybe 10, 11 months of Nogi. And, um, you know, I'm talking to friends. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to start at Dan Henderson's now and, and I'm going to do gi and no gi there. And they're like, my, my buddies are all hyping me up. Like, oh, you're going to go in there. Like, you're going to be great, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, the traditional jujitsu guys, they're like, you know, you know they're not going to know what you're doing and all this stuff. I'm like, okay. So I go in there and I think I took a no gi class first because I was still waiting for my gi to come in the mail. And I did decently well, you know. And then my gi showed up and I was all stoked. And I went in on my first uh, gi class and um, Jason was there, Poncho was there. and. Uh, I was so uh, not ready for what I was about to experience. It was just so foreign, so confusing and just the grips and people like are reaching under their leg and grabbing like my sleeve and pulling it back under. So now I'm like my arm is completely incapacitated. And I remember like looking this guy right in the face and I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. Like 
<laughs> you've got this arm trapped. I can't, I'm stuck. I can't move. Like it was just so completely foreign. And I thought I was so proficient at like jujitsu up to this point, you know, for a white belt. And I was just stuck. And I'm like, I have so much to learn. Um, and I did, um, uh, classes there for probably six months or so. Um, and then I got a promotion at work and it just kind of, uh, my hours were just too, too wild. Like I was, I went into work super early and I was there till after class already started. And I'm like, I'm never going to be the guy that shows up late to class. That's just not my personality. And I just, I took like three and a half years off and every single day or every time I saw, um, I, I still watch jujitsu matches, you know, Eddie Bravo Invitational, ADCC, stuff like that. Every single time I saw something like that, my heart just yearned for, like I wanted to be out there training so bad. And then I would see these pictures of belt promotions because I still followed like Poncho on Facebook and stuff. And I would see guys that I was, I'm like, I remember being a white belt with that guy at Hendo's and he's a purple belt now. Like, are you serious? Like I, I could be there. It was so frustrating. And I was like, I not mad. I'm not jealous or anything like that. It's just, that's my bad for, for not making it a priority. It's like, then we had the baby and then I felt guilty. My wife was like, Oh, you should try, you know, jujitsu again. stuff. I'm like, kid's so young. She goes to bed so early. I get home. Like I, I would never see my kid. I, I would, I just an immense amount of guilt. And then my wife knowing what's best for me, um, Two years ago for my birthday, got me three months of jujitsu lessons at Dedicated. And she's like, you have to go. You have to go at least twice a week. Um, it, you know, promise me you'll go. Like, I don't make me spend this money for no reason. Like, you need it mentally. You need the exercise. Like, I was getting out of shape. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I went back and I was like, okay, well, you know, I've got some no gi and I've got some gi experience. Like, and that first couple of weeks, man, I was just getting my ass handed to me just because everything, I, I, I forgot everything. I forgot how to move and like how to make my body like move and, and, you know, just didn't understand, you know, weight distribution and balances and just, just the basics of jujitsu just completely gone. You know, it's like, yeah, I knew how to arm bar somebody, but how was I going to get to that position? You know, and it was, it was a struggle in the beginning. Um, and then something just kind of clicked. And it, I think Jay is a good school in that. There's a lot of differing body types, but also in that beginning when I started, there was a lot of, there was hardly, I don't think you had a blue belt yet or maybe, yeah. So there were there was like one blue belt. Yeah. No, the, when, you know, get getting in with his school, Mm -hmm. it was, we were all basically together as white belts, right? You know, he had Gabe in there as a purple belt, right? You know, um, Zach, uh, uh, Zach, obviously, but that was it. You know, yeah. some, some drop-ins every once in a while, the, from Murrieta, from Poncho's, right. but for the most part, we were all just white belts learning. Yeah. Yeah. And it was neat to see guys. Cause I, I showed up maybe a little before his, his one year anniversary. Um, and then I saw that belt promotion and, and guys get promoted that I'd had a couple months rolling with. And I was like excited. I was like, yeah, like they fucking deserve it, dude. They, I, I watch them work their ass off every time they come in here. And it, it just kind of relit the fire in me. Like I can get there. Like, don't, don't give up now. Don't like, don't, don't, don't take another break. I was recently at work. Um, I, the, the position I, I took, uh, I, I got offered a management position for the company. I managed three different locations for them. And I, I took a step down. I was struggling at the last center. Um, I was, I was struggling, like getting it going. It was a brand new center that I opened up and, um, I feel like I was just beating my head against the wall. Like I just couldn't figure it out. The company was changing. They got bought out by like a bigger corporation and then the things that they were looking for had kind of altered and whatnot. Definitely wasn't the same company I started with. And I just got frustrated. And, and I remember like my regional manager having like a pretty hard conversation with me. Like you either need to like pull your head out of your ass or like this job's not going to be yours anymore. And I just remember saying like, well, what are my options? Like the, the, the pulling my head out of my ass, I don't even think that was an option at the, for me at mentally. I was like, I don't think that's going to happen. I just, I need something different. I need a change of pace. So I took a step down into the position that I had before as a service advisor. Uh, and I, I took a job at a, a location further. So I work in Escondido now. So that commute sucks. 
And, um, but it's been worth it just mentally. They were able to work with my schedule where I go in super early and I leave at like four o'clock. So I still get back in the area at a decent time, even after fighting through all that traffic. But like the, the mental stress I don't have anymore of being a manager or like the, the, the month end, um, you know, not sleeping because you're worried about the night before month end. Like, am I going to hit my numbers? What can I do to like, I don't deal with any of that anymore. Like I just deal with my own customers, my own cars, my own problems. And I'm really good at that. Like I'm, I'll pat my back on there. It, the job that I do, I'm very good at. I'm very efficient. Um, and I, I, you could plot me at any center in the country and I'm, I'm going to be one of the top ones just because I'm, I've done it a long time and I'm, I, I know, I know the, the recipe for success for it. So because of that, um, you have more time to listen to podcasts cause you're driving farther. Right. <laughs> well, th- this last week, um, a regional manager made a comment um, as I walked in to say goodbye to him before I was leaving for the day. And he's like, Oh, my next, my next manager. And I laughed. And I was like, no, I was like, ha. Ah. I was like, yeah, good luck with that. And then like the next day I saw him again. And I was like, I thought a little bit about what you said yesterday. And he kind of perked up. Like, I was like, yeah, I, I said, honestly, man, I'll, the chances of me being a, a manager for this company ever again is slim to none. And he's like, well, why is that? I'm like, never huh. say never. Give yourself a chance to reset. Give yourself a chance to. It's, it's not just that it, it is that I know what to do the job, right? And I'm a firm believer. If, if you're going to do anything, do it to the best of your ability. Be, I want to be the best at whatever it is that I'm doing, not for recognition or for financial gain or anything like that. Just out of pure pride. I just want to be the best. So if I'm going to be the best manager. I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be that manager. And that includes working those hours. And, um, I honestly, I was like, honestly, dude, the time with my family, the time that I have being able to go to jujitsu is so much more important at this point than like the status of being a manager or even like the the possibility of the pay that comes with it. I'm not hurting financially. I don't, it's not like I, I need it. It, I just, what I need more than anything is to make sure that my my kid knows who her dad is. My wife is happy and feels like she sees her husband that when I'm sitting at home, I'm not thinking about work. You know, I'm able with my current job, I'm able to literally at four o'clock when I clock out, I leave that shit in my office and I go home and I don't think about work at all when I'm at home because I don't have to, because I know that whatever is sitting on my desk for me the next day, I can handle it that day. Not a problem. Um, the the idea that I might start missing jujitsu because of work um, isn't an option to me. It, I understand the importance that jujitsu plays in my life at this point um, from both a physical um, standpoint, you know, just the exercise and like the, the, the cardio and, you know, the being tired, but to like the, the spiritual portion of it too, where it's just like, I'm going in there and I'm, I'm battling demons and I'm having to figure out puzzles of people. You know what I mean? Everybody's got a different game in jujitsu and something that works on this guy is not going to work on that guy. And, um, you know, it's like, it's, it's fun and it's mentally engaging and it, um, the payoff belts aside, stripes aside, anything like that. If I am, leaving work and I'm like, I don't want, I'm tired. I don't want to go to class. I, I have to go at that point. I, it, that's a promise I made to myself. If I ever tell myself, I don't want to go to class, there's no option at that point. I'm going. And even if I'm there in the warm ups and I'm like dreading it and I'm like, I'm like tired and I don't want to do it by the time that that night's over, I'm ecstatic that I went and I feel good. Even if it was a rough night, even if I was the nail and people are just hammering me into that wood or as my, my co-host on my podcast says, I'm the nail getting beat in sideways. Like, I don't care. I, at the end of the night, I feel so much better that I was able to experience that. And, uh, it's, a uh, it's something that I, I try to, I try to not preach jujitsu to people all the time, <laughs> but it's so difficult not to because it is so beneficial and I know that it's not going to work for everybody. I know that not everybody's built like that, but for the people that jujitsu resonates in, um, it, it's, uh, 
I don't know, just a, a like a massive game changer in life in general. It it is it almost sometimes sounds like a cliche, but yeah. it 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 teaches you to deal with adversity that not just when you're on the mat. It's I've got a problem, I've got something in my face right now on the mat, but if I calm down and if I think I can maybe work my way out of it. Same way in life. Yeah. But the other thing too, and you, you hit something that's really important for me. As much as the enjoyment of learning jujitsu has definitely motivated me and it, it, it motivates me every day. It's the community. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's, it's the variety of people that are all brought together with the same commonality of getting on those mats and leaving everything out the door. And, and we just come together and be a team, a, a, a unit. And when you see somebody else who does jujitsu, you understand that shared bond. Yeah. You know, that's, um, that's something that I think, I don't know how it is in law enforcement, obviously never had that job, but I think in veteran communities, when you meet, um, if I, if I show up to a, a kid's birthday party, I don't know anybody there. And this isn't, this isn't a hundred percent tried and true in every situation. There's some, there, there's, there's, people that you don't vibe with in every walk of life. But for the most part, it doesn't matter what military branch somebody was in. You could be Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, whatever. Once we start to talk and there's just a, there's a way that like veterans talk, there's like a, a shared, I wouldn't even say talk. There's a way that veterans bullshit when they're just, when they're just BSing with each other. And you, you know, like, oh, okay. And then somebody will say something military-esque and then it just you click that fuse gets lit yes and now there's this like instant bond and like i don't know this guy i've never met this guy before we're best buds the rest of the day Mm -hmm. and the next time i happen to see him out it's like he's the first person i'm going to talk to because i already know i get along with this guy and some of my best friends after i left the military were veterans and other branches of the military i had nothing to do with people that I didn't meet until 10 years after I got in the military that are my best friends to this day because that just shared military bond. You know what I mean? There's like a certain mindset about it. And that's the same way I feel a lot uh, about jujitsu. There's that. There's a reason so many veterans get into jujitsu. There's a reason why programs like the we defy program exist. It is. If you're a veteran that left the military and you're you're feeling lost and like you don't have that community anymore. And and we actually, Matt and I talked about this recently, one of our uh, podcast episodes, it was like, sometimes guys will join the military and then they'll end up at a base and they'll get out and they don't go home. They stay where they're at because that's the, the people that they've bonded with are still at that base. But then those people PCS out of there and now they're alone. And, um, and maybe going home isn't an option or maybe there's no, there's nothing good at home to go home to. Or in my situation, like, you know, going back to San Diego never really was an option for me because the people that I was friends with in high school, like I didn't talk to anymore. Like it, it, they were, they, it, they were strangers at that point, you know? So why? Like what, what's the point? Like I could go anywhere if that's the feeling I'm going to have, you know, I could, that's well, let's go to Northern California. I don't know anybody there either. It's at least it's something different, something new. Um, and so having that that the, the bond that you 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 build with people in the military is the same kind of bond you build with people on the mats in my opinion and um again it's that that trauma bonding that shared experience of like difficulty or um and then and then growth together you know and that's you know the 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 what you learn in basic training that that breaking down and building up process that's that's all jujitsu is is you go in there your first day and you you either think you know nothing and you're going to surprise yourself a little bit like, oh, I did fairly well. Or you go in there with an ego and you're like, I'm a badass and I'm going to, I'm going to tear these people up. And then you get humbled very quickly. And then you realize how completely foreign it is and you, how you have no idea what you're doing. And you either, it either breaks you and you leave and you, you don't come back or maybe you come back years down the road when you're a different person or you let it break you and you stay and you let it build you back up at that point. So that's, that's the, the bond that I've developed with people in our, in our class and our school and stuff. And there's guys that it kind of, I saw guys, some guys get blue belts and kind of disappear. 
for whatever reason, you know, uh, be it work or whatever. And it, it, it breaks my heart that they're gone, you know, like, where's he at? I miss him, you know? And then every once in a while he'll pop back up. I'm like, hell yeah. You know, I'm stoked. You know, let's get a roll and see how it, we haven't rolled in a long time. Did you lose anything or did I get better? You know, let's, let's figure it out, you know, and let's see where you're at now. And then, um, you know, the, you see these new people come in and, um, you can tell if, uh, if someone's going to stay, you know, relatively quickly, I think at at, at our point we can see if, okay, this guy's going to be here for at least a couple of months or something like that. And then you get excited to like show them things and then you kind of see them like things will click in them or you'll see, you'll see them make mistakes that you made. And you're just like, Hey, let me save you a couple months of, uh, you know, self-loathing <laughs> here. And let me, let me tell you how not to do that anymore or why I keep catching you with this same submission because you're just giving it to me and you don't know why. It's cool when you see that person come in now. I mean, with us having so little experience when you really compare the overall, Oh yeah. but we have enough now to where somebody new comes in and you see that eagerness to learn and you see that light switch start clicking on you. Like, yeah. Oh, this is the, it, it's, it's already fun to be able to have enough experience to see that in somebody where they're not getting frustrated. They're like, Oh, this is challenging and it's fun. Right. I think, um, one of the things that used to scare me, especially is like a white belt, even like a later white belt is when I would see like a purple belt from ponchos come in or a brown belt. I don't want to, I'm going to avoid that guy like the plague tonight. Cause I don't feel like getting smashed. And I'm to the point now where it's the opposite. It's like, let's see how well I like he, he's probably going to beat the hell out of me, but let's see how far I can get with him. You know, maybe I get lucky, you know, maybe something, maybe something that we're working on over here. They don't, they're not working on over there and it's, it's not going to make sense to them. I will say this though, like Poncho students that their, their pressure is insane. Just slightly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's my goal. Whenever I see one of Poncho's guys come over, it's like, let's not end up on bottom today. <laughs> let's see if I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I, I like, I like going over to and that, he breeds them big for some reason. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. It, I go to their open mats every once in a while, just cause it's a nice little like test, you know, it's kind of, it's almost like the, the field of competition. Like, not that, not so much the nerves, but like I'm going into unknown territory and I don't know how any of these guys roll. I've never rolled with any of them. And let's see how well my jujitsu against a stranger stacks up against somebody who is also trained. Um, and he's, he's got some, some guys over there that, yeah, he does. He breeds them big, man. The thing that I have really come to enjoy about it also is that broader community. Because now when I travel, I throw a gi in my bag. Nice. And I hit up a studio and say, Hey, I'm going to be here for three or four days. Do you mind if I drop in? And I have met some awesome people who are always welcoming. I have never walked into it, had an experience walking into a studio where I felt like I wasn't, Hey, now granted, inevitably you're always going to roll with either a Brown or a black, your first roll. Cause they got to uh-huh. test you out before they, you know, unleash right. you on their students. Right. Um, but, and I'm perfectly okay with that. But the fact that I've always felt welcome. I was in Vegas back in April and just started texting with the coach. It's like, come on down. You know, uh, I don't know if I can, I'll be here. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, it was, it was the, the fact that he was willing to kind of stretch out his day when he was planning to leave. Cause it was just an open mat day. Gotcha. You know, oh, I'll stay, I'll stay for a little bit longer, you know, kind of deal. So I, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and I like that sense of community. I like that sense of welcoming no matter what. Yeah. I think there's a neat thing too about jujitsu um, that I, I never really experienced in other martial arts and it's the lineage. Um, and I think that's, what's kind of neat about like a larger gym. Like we attend how we're, uh, we're a, a part of a checkmat family. And if you go to most any checkmat in the country, you know that it's only a handful of degrees away from like Poncho and Jason at that point. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's Leo Vieira, Poncho, Jason. We're, we're, we're right under top uh, that top tier, you know? So, any of their black belts is going to be essentially like right in the same area that Jason is. So you know you're, that you're, you're learning very similar jujitsu or, right. um, and there, there's definitely styles of jujitsu depending on the schools that you go to. Like check has a very tried and true style. And, and it's, it's the reason why, and I'm not just like riding the check bandwagon here, but it, it's a reason why check competitors tend to play so high in, in these, you know, larger world competitions and things like that, even like on the professional level. Um, and it's neat to know that, that 
you're a, a part of that lineage as well, you know, and, and if, and if I'm able to attain a black belt under a check mat school, I say that because I don't plan on being in California forever. Um, it, it would be a huge honor to me, you know? So I'm, I've looked at where we're going. I'm, I'm even trying to like jokingly cause Matt's a black belt and he's about to get a second degree. And I'm like, and I'm like, you've been at, you've been at UPS for 20 years, bro. Like retire <laughs> when I go to Cal or when I go to Texas, you guys got to come to, we'll open up a check mat school. You can be the head instructor. Like, you know, that way I can get a black belt under, you know, a, a check mat black belt that's under poncho. You know what I mean? I think that would be rad. So how long do you think your plan is to get out of California? I think 2025, summer 2025 is our goal. Um, uh, before my kids start second grade. Um, I think financially that's the, you know, the, the savings timeline, that's how it should work out and whatnot. So, uh, we'll, we'll see what the economy does as well. Um, right now it seems like buying a house anywhere is becoming increasingly impossible. Um, and our plan isn't to buy immediately. We want to get there and make sure we, we know the area right. before we purchase something. Um, so we're not buying in a bad area or something like that, but, um, yeah, that's the goal. She has a lot of family. My wife has a lot of family out there. Her mother, um, her aunt and uncle that she's really close to and cousins, uh, they all li moved out there like 10 years ago. Her grandma uh, is out there now. So it's like she has no actual family in California other than her younger brother. Um, and then uh, my parents moved to Arizona a couple of years ago when they retired. And my my sister, um, my mom's daughter, passed away a couple of years ago. So I, I have no real family in California either. Like I don't speak with my father, none of my Northern California other than my cousin do I have any sort of like an, a, like a real relationship with? And it, it's not that Northern California is so far away from here. People, <laughs> if, if you lived in California, your, your own, your whole life, you don't realize how small the rest of the States are. You know what right. I mean? It's like, I have friends who are like, Oh, you know, they live in Tennessee and he's like, Oh, I drove down to Georgia yesterday. I'm like, what? Like, any, <laughs> like for lunch, you know? And I'm like, for lunch, what are you talking about? Like, he's like, Oh, it's like an hour and a half away. I'm like, what? Nothing. LA is not even an hour and a half away. And I live next to it. You know, it's like, it's so crazy how big this state is from North to South. And then you can compile it with or compound it with all the traffic. So, right. Right. So let's start wrapping it up. Okay. Based on what we started with your podcast. The yeah. one thing is good marketing. Mention the name. Yeah. BJJ balance. Um, I I'll admit it. AI came up with that name. So, um, I, Matt, my co-host runs a, uh, a jujitsu meme page with a large following. And he came in and he taught um, a, a class for Jason one day, like a guest guest spot. And he's a larger guy. Um, it's like six foot two fifty ish, whatever. So his, his game is, is built more for larger guys. And I'm not that size, but I'm definitely, I'm not the 145 pound, you know, spry quick. I'm not, I'm not, uh, Zach, you know, Zach's like a gazelle. He, yeah. He'll jump over me four or five times before I have a, an opportunity to do anything. So when Matt came in and showed, you know, what he, he likes to play lasso garden. And when he showed some lasso demonstration, uh, I was like, it, it resonated with me. So I messaged him on Instagram and I was like, thank you. I appreciate you coming in like that. What you taught tonight really worked for me. So thank you. And then I started following his page and he posted some stuff and I made some comments on it and he hit me up in the DMS and he's just like, we had had some disagreements, but like, you know, lighthearted. He's like, Oh, we should have a podcast. Like you, you know, you don't agree with me on everything. I'm like, yeah, I'm down. And then I sent him like pictures, some stuff that I had. I'm like, I have most of the stuff to do a podcast. So not because I've ever done one, just I collected it for doing other things. You were doing live streaming for a while, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I still do here and there. Um, kind of lost my love for it. Just, um, I, I like to play video games, but I don't do it when my family's awake. Um, cause I like to give my, my time, my awake time to my family. So I was doing it late at night and it just, Sometimes I don't feel like playing video games till two o'clock in the morning. Um, I just want to sleep. I'm getting older now. So it just, it, it the, we spoke about the consistency of a podcast The streaming's the same way. It's like you've, if you're, if you told the people that you stream to, you're going to be there every Friday and Saturday at 11 o'clock at night until three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning, you better be there. Cause if you don't miss, or if you miss a, a, one of those days, they're going to go find another stream to watch. Right. And that person may be entertaining and they might just start going there from now on. So it's just one of those things where I, I, I knew I couldn't be consistent with it, but I enjoy, I've always enjoyed like the uh, production side of it, like dialing in my camera, making sure it looks as good as possible. Like the lighting aspect making sure my sound quality is good. And like I come from like a film background and, and in my time in DJing, I really learned like some audio tricks and stuff like that. So it's like, I really enjoy like 
you know, messing with compressors and EQing stuff and like adding noise gates and like really the polishing that product to make it as clean looking and sounding as possible. Whereas there's people that have been streaming way longer than me and they, it, it's just like, man, it's like looking at a potato on the screen. It's just not, there's nothing polished about it. And it's like, we, you can dial that in with not a lot of money um, and, and just start to add little things to it as you start to make money with it. So for a little while I was making a little bit of money. I was making a couple hundred bucks a month streaming. Um, so I just put that back into streaming stuff and stop paying for it out of my pocket. Did Matt have any experience with podcasting? Uh, I, I believe he had a, um, a podcast with, um, not jujitsu related, just like sports related in general. Um, but I think it was pretty short lived. The person that he was doing it with ended up moving. Um, and, uh, he just never kind of went after it after that. So when he mentioned it, I was like, yeah, we could do it. And then he came over. We had, we'd met at, at dedicated that one time, but never, I didn't have like a friendship with the guy or anything like that. And he came over one day and we recorded our first episode and vibed really well. And he was like, let's keep doing it. And I was like, yeah. So it's uh we're seven episode seven comes out on Tuesday of uh, this week. And yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a blast. So from the backbone or, or where do you guys want to take the podcast to? What are you hoping to accomplish with it? I think when you listen to other jujitsu podcasts, they're very dry and it's a lot of guys discussing like technique and discussing like the intricacies of jujitsu and they're very stale about it. Or like there's, we talked about like jujitsu lineage and stuff earlier. There's like this still kind of like a, um, uh, it is a martial art and people do view it as like this, like mystic kind of like, you know, you got to pay respects to every aspect of it. And it's like, I don't disagree with that necessarily, but it's got to be fun and entertaining as well. So that's where our podcast comes in. We're trying to be like the, the bros on the mat after a class or after open mat, just BSing with each other, uh, you know, just having fun. You know what I mean? Like talking about things that we love about jujitsu and the things that we find funny, but also it's not a technique breakdown and it's not, we're not calling things by like their proper Japanese names and things like that. It's like, cause nobody remembers them. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. You hear some guys talk about jujitsu and they're just like, Oh, you know, he's going from Ashigurami to Ashi. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there going like, what? Like grab his ankle. Like, let's just, and then you take the actual Japanese translation of Ashigrami or whatever, you know, whatever move it is. And it translates to like ankle grab. And you're just like, come on guys. Yeah. 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 We're using $5 words when a $1 word works. So, well, it's cool though, that you're kind of taking a little bit of the mystique and, and I don't mean mystique in a, in a bad way, but obviously there's a barrier of entry to some people because they don't understand everything. Right. And if you can remove a little bit of that and just dumb it down, talk in not $5 words, right? it's going to help people be like, oh, that's what it is. So I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to understand like the, um, the IBJJF like competition side of things because my exposure to jujitsu initially was through 10th planet and they don't compete in that. They mostly compete in no like point. ADCC or yeah, yeah. Typically no point uh submission only tournaments is typically what they're big on because they're 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 constantly looking for the submission. They don't care about getting neon belly and getting two points from it or taking the back and getting four points. That that doesn't mean anything to them. Did I get the finish or not? That's all they care about. Which I respect to an extent, but at the same time, I um viewing jujitsu as more than just a a scramble and a submission uh, art and more of like this intricate, slow moving like chess match. You know what I mean? Where like little micro movements definitely matter. And how many points can I rack up on this person? Because I wait for them to make us a, a wrong move. And I capitalize on that. Like I've really started to like learn to love that. Um, But I, I, I understand that like the IBJJF rules can be to a, to a, an inexperienced or somebody just, you know, off the street. If my wife came to sit down and watch, if, if we, it was like watch a UFC fight or watch like an IBJJF a jiu jitsu match, like she's way more entertained by the UFC than she would be by that. But it, it might be like roles reversed for me. I don't care about watching. I, I love you uh, MMA, but I, to, to watch two guys strike almost exclusively versus, you know, watch some actual technicians on the ground doing high level jujitsu. I'm more inclined to lean towards the jujitsu watching at that point. So, but I think that's where things like ADCC, 
make a lot of sense because they are exciting and and it's kind of a mixture of both the the first half of an ADCC match is no points and it's it's there uh to to be entertaining if 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 you don't have to worry about you know going for a takedown and missing it and like getting stacked and, and him getting side control and you don't have to worry about losing points there and it's just a positional match at that point then like you maybe you'll take that that chance um and then the second half of the match so if the match is 10 minutes long the first five minutes will be no points um and the second five minutes will be um will be points so we'll start to count and then the first half um you can't you you start standing nobody can pull guard so a lot of traditional matches you know even IBJJF stuff you'll watch two guys walk to the center of the mat and maybe one of them drops to his butt and grabs a leg or something like that they they do not allow that in ADCC you have to try to wrestle to get your advantage so you have to learn takedowns you have to learn uh, you know how to uh, throws and you know how to how to take a shot how to take someone's back and that, that scramble aspect is there so when I took my stepdad to uh the adcc open at the beginning of the summer in orange county him having no grab like no jujitsu experience um but having a high wrestling background he really enjoyed it so it was essentially these guys are wrestling starting standing up and when they end up on the ground it's ending in some sort of a submission finish and he was really excited about that's like wrestling but that you get to kill the guy at the end you know and he was like really you know it was it was definitely um easier for somebody that doesn't come from the jiu-jitsu background to understand. So I, I think that's what's neat about jiu-jitsu. It's, there's so many facets of it, you know, and so many different, um, different ways to watch it. It just depends. You got to find the right piece. And I think that's kind of what's missing in a lot of jiu-jitsu um, media is that you're, we're, we're essentially, I don't know, the ADCC podcast of, you know, versus the IBJJF guys or whatever. Right. We're, we're trying to just be more accessible to the to the average listener. I have a lot of friends that don't do jujitsu that do listen just because we try to be funny and we try to, like, you know, uh, take the piss of, of you know, some of the stuff that happens in jujitsu. And it's like, yeah, it's like it's dudes that are getting sweaty rolling around in pajamas. <laughs> like, it's, you know, okay, I get it. That's funny. But at the same time, you know, it's, it, it's, there's, there's uh, a beauty to it that, I think the more you get into it, the more, you know, uh, you'll start to appreciate that. So, well, one of the things that you mentioned about how some people don't find it, the technical aspect as exciting because it can be a very slow methodical process. But the other factor to that, that comes to my mind is as you get older, you have to change your game, right? You know, for the longevity of your ability to keep doing it, you're right. going to, you're going to change. But then I, and, and I'm not a boxing guru, but I've heard it explained this way. One of the things that makes Floyd, Weather, Floyd Mayweather so great, it wasn't that he went in there to try to smash you or beat you. It's, I'm not going to let you hit me. Right. It's the same way with jujitsu. You can go with the mindset that I'm going to go 100 miles an hour and I'm going to smash you, or I'm going to go in there and I'm not going to give you the opportunities to put me in bad positions. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, I think that, um, a lot of jujitsu is, and, and that's the thing too, is me learning it, like truly learning it at, you know, the age of 39 when I started and, and, uh, you know, now being 40 and whatnot, it's like, I don't have the explosive energy that I had in my twenties and whatnot. And so it's like, I, I don't even know what that's like to, to be able to scramble at that pace. Cause I, I didn't do it then, but I wish, I wish I understood, but maybe it's, you know, maybe it, it's a little easier cause I'm not having to like change my game. I'm just having to develop what I have. Um, but there's definitely, but, th but that's, what's cool about it too, is that I can watch guys that have this methodical slow game beat these guys that have the energy in the fast paced game. Because if you, if you have the tools to make them play your game, and not stumble into the traps and play their game, then then you can come out on top. And that's why that's where it becomes a chess game. Yeah, it's it's playing to your strengths, or more importantly, not playing into their strengths. Right. Yeah. It's. I again, I I feel like I'm a CrossFit guy trying to like preach the gospel of CrossFit <laughs> to people who want to talk about jujitsu, and that's not the thing. No, that's not the case. It's it is so hugely beneficial to people from every walk of life, um, men, women, big guys, small guys, you know what I mean? Like, um, is everybody going to get 
super thin doing jujitsu? No, I, I know a lot of guys that just stay big, you know, but could you, you know what I mean? Especially if you live like a sedentary lifestyle and then now all of a sudden you're burning 800 to a thousand calories in an hour and a half of jujitsu, which is totally a possibility. I see it happen all the time. You know, there's guys where or the guys, there's times where I'm sitting there and just pouring sweat and I'm like, I don't ever. That's just the warm ups. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> That's me in the warm ups. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, if, if, if you haven't tried jujitsu and you're thinking about it or you've, you've ever thought about it, like just go give it a shot one time and you'll either love it or, or you, you'll be indifferent about it. But, um, it, you'll, at least you'll understand too. You know what I mean? How you, you'd ever see anybody that's ever done jujitsu act like, Oh, just do this. You know what I mean? Like it's anybody that's ever rolled at least one time in a class understands it. Like it, that's not how it works. Like you can't just stand up. You can't just, just roll away from it or something like that. Like it, sometimes it's impossible to move sometimes. Oh, just lift them off of you. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. I I've had guys that are 40 pounds lighter than me pressure tap me. I've had a guy in no gi that, that is 40 pounds li- lighter than me get knee on belly and I could not get him off of me. And I had to tap because I, I suffocated just on my back and couldn't move. And it's like, if that's not a testament to how well it works, if you're good at it, then I don't know what is. My big thing now is <clears throat> if you have young children, put them in jujitsu. Oh yeah. Because it's, it's such a natural thing for kids to just want to get on the ground and wrestle with each other. Right. And then from there to learn technique that they can go on and know as a parent that they can protect themselves and defend themselves. Right. Uh, that That's my thing is get your kids into it. Right. And they, they, there's little friendships that they develop and whatnot are rad to see. Like I have my youngest daughter, she's five, she does it. And she is, uh, in this jujitsu class with a bunch of other five-year-olds and they all go for pizza next door afterwards. And like that, she sees them when one of them goes on vacation for like a week during the summer and they come back, she runs up to him. Oh, and gives him a hug and stuff like those are, those are their friends. And if my child's friends growing up are all badasses that train, like I, yeah, the, the amount of worry that, that I would have versus what I have is, is gone. Cause I not only can she take care of herself, but all of her friends can, can, can take care of themselves as well. And they're also less likely to be bullies. Aggressive, yeah. Aggressive hotheads and whatnot. I think that's one of the things that from, from Taekwondo, they have these things called the tenets of Taekwondo and it's courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self or uh, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, something else in self-control. Um, indomitable spirit and self-control and they make you recite these every day at the beginning and the end of class and then every class they go into one of them in depth and i think that um people that train mma exclusively mma is like a sport and not a martial art are missing a lot of that um that that respect aspect of it or that you know that martial arts kind of mindset and i think that's something that even though i don't think jiu-jitsu has anything like that as far as tenants are concerned there's definitely, you learn all of those lessons just by being on the mat and learning how difficult it is and learning um, that, that you may be good at something, but some guy could show up one day and just totally be better than you. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just, okay, now I got to keep going. I got to, I got to be better. And like I said previously, you learn lineage. Yeah. And where it came from. Yeah. So I, I, there's, there's uh, a, you know, part of it being a martial art that I think is, is good for children as well. And, and um, when you have those um, tenants or whatever kind of like inlaid in your training or your mindset, especially from a, a young child's age and whatnot, that they, you tend to be less, less hot, less confrontational because, especially because, you know, you never know who, who the other guy is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I may be a, you know, if I'm a kid, a, a jujitsu green belt or something like that. And I've been training for five years and I probably could beat up the majority of the kids in my class, but there could be a kid there that has also been doing it and I just don't know it and he's better than I am and he wrecks me. You know what I mean? So it's like knowing that that's a possibility, there tend to be less, um, uh, uh, lean less into trying to start a fight or, you know what I mean? It's, 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 and I've seen it happen with, um, with Jason. I I've saw a confrontation, um, one time where he wasn't involved in it directly, but he was trying to like calm it down and he wasn't like, shirt off you know i'm a black belt you just he nothing like that you know what i mean it's just like hey you know just trying to like isolate the situation separate the two people 
it wasn't about like trying to prove what he could do or, or couldn't do. You know what I mean? It, it was about just like people can get hurt here and I want to make sure if I can prevent that, I, I, I can. And, you know, if it got to the point where he needed to act, then I feel bad for those people. <laughs> um, but it, it, it doesn't get to that place. And you just guys that train genuinely train like a martial art like that. You typically don't see that kind of attitude from them. They, they they've been humbled enough to know, just chill out and, you know, we, there's other ways to, you know, resolve this issue. So what's the old adage? Those that can do it don't have to brag about being able to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why anytime you see somebody getting, you know, uh, boisterous and, you know, puffing their chest and whatnot, it, it's just like, oh God, you know, are we going to do this guy? You know, it's just. So you guys, for your podcast, you've also start. Cause you didn't have video straight out of the gate, correct? No. So we've always recorded video from the beginning. But the intention was always for it to be an audio podcast and just uh, use the video for clips um, to drive on social media to get people to the audio. And then one day I was just, I think it was like episode four. I was like, let me try. Let me see how hard it is to edit video. What bums me out is the editing program that I edit in um, is really, it's, it's a program that like they use to grade Hollywood movies and whatnot for color grading and whatnot. But and, it, and I, I like the workflow, but it doesn't have plugin support, whereas Adobe Premiere does have plugin support. So third party people can make a plugin that goes into Premiere. And now they make one called Autopod. And you put in two cameras with two audio sources and you sync the audio sources to the cameras. Then you say um, it uses AI essentially and it knows whose voice is which and it auto cuts all the video in seconds. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. So usually. DaVinci Resolve is pretty good at implementing those kind of things um, into the software afterwards. They'll see it be a hit in Premiere or something like that, and they'll go, okay, we can we can do that. Or like there was um, an AI plugin for like noise isolation that was pretty big for a while, um, and DaVinci Resolve created a noise isolation plugin inside the software. They don't charge for it. It's just a part of it now, and it works phenomenal. So um, I'm hoping DaVinci Resolve comes up with something kind of like the audio, Autopod um and uh, that would make my job a lot easier. <laughs> so. so YouTube, all the major podcasting platforms? Yes. So uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Samsung Podcasts, Stitcher, all that stuff. Um, and then um, YouTube, uh, it's, it's at BJJ Balance because um, YouTube handles now make you put the at sign. And um, TikTok, Instagram. Instagram's probably our, our busiest social media. That's where we get the most engagement. Um. But yeah, every Tuesday, 8 a.m. is the release, and uh, once a week. So that's the that's the goal from here on out. Well, very cool. I appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate you watching. But before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>